It was a very happy fleet. It was a very happy fleet that entered Alexandria. As we picked up our mooring, it was easy to make comparison between the Italian fleet as it now existed and the naval might assembled in our British base. Side by side in the centre of the harbour lay Warspite, Valiant, Malaya, Ramillies and Barham. The aircraft carriers, illustrious and eagle, submarines alongside their depot ship and rows of cruisers and destroyers. Further in were oil tankers, fleet auxiliaries and merchant ships, while in the water between pinnaces and tenders tore around, dodging the felucas with their off-white sails. It was a hive activity and a most impressive sight. We pilots, however, could not help thinking, what a superb target. Although many considered us biased, we of the fleet air arm thought that the day of the great capital ship was over, when it could be menaced from the air at sea and was so vulnerable in the harbour that it had to be based far away from the area where it was most needed. We could not know it then, but we were to be proved right when the Japanese copied us at Pearl Harbour. The Pacific War was virtually to be controlled by superior carrier air power. We had broken through history to open a new area, era in sea warfare. Toronto was to become a very famous victory. Now, please note that's not me saying the Japanese copied the America, uh, copied the British because they didn't. That's not what I would ever say, actually, because they'd started their planning far earlier, and all this did was, in many ways, Toronto was a proof of concept for something they'd already been working on because they actually had an idea what the British had been planning for Wilhelm's Haven even before. World War One had ended. So that had been shared with the Japanese, and the Japanese have been doing their own work as of the Americans. It's kind of like multi-carrier doctrine. Everyone goes, oh, it's something which the Japanese come up with. It's not. All the navies are working on it to a lesser or greater extent in different ways. The British have been working on it since, well, pretty much the end, uh, since pretty much before the end of World War One, when they've been looking at it from the point of view of, our oh, carriers can only carry six or seven aircraft, so we need two of them to launch a decent strike. Kind of makes sense. But the point is, those words of summary rather do give you an idea of the impact of Toronto. And that's what tonight's about. Tonight is about what created Toronto, what happened at Toronto, and what the impact of Toronto was. So with that, let's say hello to everyone. Hello, Carl Gasberg. Hello, John Shea. Hello, Dunrick Ironhammer. Hello, Peter Dawson. Hello, Frank Sifato. Hello, Albazaski. Hello, Jonathan Burrow. Nick's in the harbour and creates a ruckus before tea and crumpets. Hmm. Uh, Carl also, 103rd anniversary of Polish independence. Hmm. Next one, Dr. C. What happened to all the men in Toronto attack? Do any of the aircraft survive today or anything from the battle at all? Honestly, I, I don't think so. Um, some of them, like John Wellham, wrote books, and I have a couple of those. Some... They all went uh, carried on serving through the war. Some of them survived, some of them didn't. Uh, the ships involved, I don't think any of those are still around. No. I don't think anything of Toronto has been preserved. Honestly. I don't think any of the current swordfish still in existence. And still, in, uh, still, uh, still able to be seen with one of some of the ones involved in Toronto. I think if there was such an aircraft in, still around, I'm fairly sure that would be made a song and dance of every year at Toronto on the Toronto anniversary, and so I, I I don't see it happening. Everyone keeps referencing Pearl Harbor as equivalent, so I'm going to try to figure out what exactly we've done for ship losses, and I think it's eight battleships in Pearl Harbor, correct? Uh, I think roughly. Uh, honestly, It is an equivalent, but it is an equivalent, and this is one of the interesting things. There have been lots, lots of comments over my lot after the Long Patrol summary, where I did draw some parallels between the two. But it's also quite, it's different in that this is one carrier, because that's what the British have available. They plan for two carriers, they execute with one. 
and it's 20 aircraft and it's how do i put this it's 20 aircraft which yes to our eyes they do look very old-fashioned but those points they are mature in service a mature very mature capability they've been around for long enough their crews know how to get the best out of them it's kind of like the modern super hornet which we all consider a fairly decent aircraft but let's be honest there's the f-22 in the world there's the f-35 love it or hate it um there's lots of newer theoretically more advanced more capable aircraft we can debate their merits but the reality is the super hornet's still quite a deadly aircraft you don't really want to pick a fight with it you don't really want it coming into attack with you and that's the same the swordfish at this point uh ian car the ship's bell from hs lustrous remains at the fleet terror museum some at uk badly damaged during the later lupo attack not sure about other matters you raised no i think that's about all that exists I take it on. I could imagine Taranto is worse if it was illustrious, middle, and victorious with very barracudas. Mm, yes, it would be worse if they were all, had we all been armed with fairy barracudas. It would have been worse if you'd had more carriers. It would have been worse with HMS Eagle and still flying swordfish. Because of the scenario you're dealing with. Alanautical Wolf. Littorio being, uh, being salvageable is better than uh, M.N. Leonardo da Vinci, I suppose, as blew up. Mm. Not a wolf. Uh, half. Modern Taranto with U.S. CVGs and, and Queen Lizards. It's turning into a fun Ford Experiment war game. It's been a while since I fired up Command Modern Ops. Hmm, enjoy. Hello, M35 Benvids. Hello, George Newman. Hello, Jonathan Burrow. Hello, Ron Cash. Yes. Oh! Dang blasted. I walked the dog and I forgot to transfer my poppy. And now it's back in the house. So, sorry, I would be wearing a poppy, but if I go back in the house and disturb the dogs, it will be ages before I get out, and then I'll be running late for everyone, so sorry. Doctor Z, could the British have made a bomb from battleship cells like the AGN did? How effective could it have been if used at Toronto? Uh, yes, they could have. How effective would depend on the bomb? You can make a. Anyone can make a bomb from a shell if they want to. It's a technical. It's an engineering capacity. It's one of those things. If they thought they wanted to, if they wanted to, they could have done. The big problem the British had with bombs at Toronto was they were. How do I put this politely? Uh, they had many mechanical issues. They were not uh, not good quality control. It was a um... how do I put this? The bombs at Toronto were the last batch of bombs which came to the fleet air arm, which were quality controlled by the air ministry. After that point, after that point, they became quality controlled by the Ministry of Supply, uh, which was set up during World War Two. Uh, the Ministry of Supply, and they they took over quality control and sorting out those things, and the quality of bombs got better. Hi, DH eighty nine. Hello, Andrew Bend. Hello, Cash. I hope you've enjoyed the night, uh, night 6831. Hello, DG40. Hello, Stephen Richards. Hello, Effenhund. Hello, Sean B. <laughs> Hello, Melanie 1640. Richmond, Toronto. Not famous because Hollywood never made, made a movie of attack. Ah, uh, they should make a movie of it. It would be fun. And there is an American officer sitting there watching. Hello, Wesley Phillips. Hello, Eric. Frank Spider, uh, what are the great losses of our institutional notional knowledge? What could be done to regain the lost knowledge? Uh, there have been a lot of losses of institutional knowledge with the shrinking of the RN over the years. And you pretty much have to do what you did in the 1890s. In the 1890s, the Royal Navy, the head of Royal Navy Intelligence and a senior, na and senior academic na historian set up 
the Navy Record Society to provide historical papers and books to try and rebuild that institutional not memory and maintain the institutional memory. And that's pretty much what you need to rejuvenate. Hello, Andreas Glad. Hello, Michelle Oates. Hello, Ian Carr. Hello, Colin Cameron. And I've caught up, I think. Come, Gato. Funny thing, the F-22 flew before the Osu bug, but was introduced later. I know. It's a... Mm. Ian Carl, what would the operation look like if it was launched in mid thirties from Atreus Glorious and was she fitted with uh, fitted the beacon aircraft homing system there? Yeah, just about had the homing beacon system then, but they had other plans for how to do it at that point, including shining a great big searchlight vertically up in the air. Um at a certain the pre appointed time. And <laughs> And it was interesting. Uh, how do I put it? They would have carried it out. It would have probably involved actually slightly more swordfish. Because that's the interesting thing. Cor uh, Glorious probably has a 60 aircraft air group in practice, kind of like Ark Royal. If you listen to one of the recent bilge pumps where... No, it's coming out in the Bilge Pump special, where me and Jamie and Drac are discussing things. You will hear that we're sort of talking and uh, talking it through and going through it and thinking, well, Ark Royal, in effect, has a 60 aircraft air group, and in effect, that's what Courageous and Glorious each operate, in effect, once you in the Mediterranean. In the North Atlantic, the air group changes slightly because you can't do deck parking and other things in the North Atlantic. Don't do deck parking. It's one of the uh, the old things of history. The amount of people, uh, the Americans and the Japanese both fun function in deck parking as part of their air groups. And again, this is usually used to go to the Royal Navy and the Royal, uh, Royal Navy and go, well, your air groups are smaller. And the Royal Navy's going, the Americans don't even use deck parking in the North Atlantic. No one uses deck parking in the North Atlantic. It's a nightmare trying to deck park in the North Atlantic. You just don't want to. Sorry. <clears throat> Accent's coming in. I've spent too, day too long doing pe other people's sort of conversations. And, um... Yeah, it's, it it's one of those things. But a, a, a glorious a strike would probably involve mm, about double the number of swordfish. Sorry, I've got some banging on my door. Oh. Someone has heard, a very helpful sister has heard about the lack of a poppy. Thank you. I won't lose it. As it's my sister's poppy, and so I don't lose it, it'll go up there, okay? <sighs> the point I was trying to make was that this all starts out a lot earlier. That they start talking about an aerial attack on a fleet in the harbour in World War I, because the Royal Navy is trying to drive the German fleet to sea. All right, let's see. Uh, hello, Spencer Kremen. And Knight 6 Aaron, could the swordfish carry a battleship shell converted into one guy no munition? Probably. It would depend how, what size and what thing, uh, shell you're doing, but she can carry a 1,800 pound torpedo. So let's see. Uh, yeah, the four, a problem, the, definitely she could take the 14 inch. So if you took the 14 inch shell, which was the newest shell the Royal Navy had, um, yeah, that weighs in at 1,590 pounds. So a swordfish could have carried that. But they didn't think about that at that time because 
all the emphasis was going in on developing the torpedo to be the primary killing asset. And again, if you were talking to a Royal Navy Admiral in 1930s and you were going, well, do you want to turn your un your shell into an anti ship sh uh, your fourteen inch shell into an anti ship shell? They would look at you and go, "But I have a torpedo." And you'd go, "What? Well, but it'll be really capable. It would be really capable." But I have a torpedo. That's going to create a hole in the top. And yes, it might create a big hole and go through, and it it might cause a lot of damage. But this will create a hole in the bottom, which will sink it. And what I want to do is sink the enemy, or slow them down. Either way, a torpedo works for me. Andreas Glad, hey, regarding your earlier answer regarding the firebrand, imagine the original spec firebrand replacing the string band to get to Toronto. <whistles> Would have been worrying for everyone. I'm avoiding that question, Frank Spadano. Uh, Albert Zaski, question about Italian uh, armor usage. RM ships were armed with 100mm and 90mm AA guns. Maybe some leftover 76 and 90mm was also standard AA over the Italian army. So why are there 12.5cm, 10.7cm, 8.7cm using defense? Can I understand 8.8? .8, that's probably German flak, but the other calibers were very odd. They just use everything, is all I can answer, and that's their own list of ammos. So they had some other guns, which were land-based guns, which they turned on the attacking aircraft. Hmm. Andreas Glad. Hey, regarding an earlier uh, answer, I'll answer that one. Colin Cameron. I know there was a possible operation of dropping mines in the Rhine that France blocked. Was a similar scheme thought of for the Italian harbors? Yes. And carried out at certain points. At certain points. In car, was Admiral Cunningham convinced in the capabilities of the fleet air arm prior to Toronto, or were his eyes opened by the results? Cunningham had had some interesting run-ins with Henderson over the years, and certainly that had earned he had started to respect the fleet air arm more as a capability. But you have to remember that whilst it's very easy to talk about capabilities on paper, it's when you actually do something that people go, oh, that works. It's like... There is the difference between you passing your driving test and the first time you take a parent, your parents out on the road. You know, it's a case of they know you can drive in theory, but in practice, they've never been driven by you. And then suddenly you're driving. Oh. That's excellent. The British didn't have any obsolete 13 and a half inch shells lying around. Not really, sadly enough. So the World War One target was, of course, Wilhelmshaven. And the World War Two target we're talking about is Taranto. But actually, this could have been a World War Two target as well. However, the RAF claimed priority. They said their bombers would hit it. And by the time they did, the German fleet had mostly moved to safer harbours. Pete Dawson. The original Firebrand was a Sabre engine fighter. The original Firebrand was a Sabre engined aircraft, but it was, all, it was still going to be capable of carrying torpedoes. I think they were... They were still talking about it carrying an a uh, carrying a torpedo. That was still part of the planet of the idea. Looking at it, it was a strike fighter. They were talking about for the firebrand, to use the modern terminology. It was sort of an extra thing. In car, lots of obsolete naval guns were used in shore batteries, such as the Straits of Dover. Oh yeah. How effective would be parachute drop torpedoes like mo uh, how modern ASW works for, for uh, from Sawfish? Well, most of the lightweight torpedoes we use these days are actually a lot lighter than the sort of torpedo which was dropped from Sawfish. Um, but, well, 
The question is, how high and how fast are you moving when you drop the torpedo? And that that's the real sort of question. If you're dropping a parachute-based torpedo and you're relying on it slowing it down and bringing it into the water nicely, you need to be flying faster and higher. Uh, and one of the reasons why the Swordfish did as well as it did at Toronto, which is one of the things it had an advantage over the others, was how slow and low it could fly. Because that made it below quite a lot of the AA guns. <laughs> they couldn't get down to it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hated riding my father. When I was, I was uh, I asked someone else was driving, he always acted like he was in a minute danger of dying. I think that's just something fathers did. Don't worry. Anyway, Wilhelm's Haven. Now, the point about this is that it's a blooming annoying place if the German Navy's in there to try and get them out. And it's not really, thanks after you, lo you lose access to Heligoland, that easy to get your fleet into there to bombard them. So when they were talking about this in World War I, they were looking at it as a spoiling fight. They were looking at it from the perspective of, let's go in, let's take out something, or just hit something. The whole point of the Sop with Cuckoo wasn't exactly... Will they hit you? Will they not? Uh, the damage they'll cause. It was a case of, you're getting torpedoed in harbour. Rather like what Wellam just said in his quote about after Taranto. The moment you can start hitting ships in harbour, then the Germans are either forced to withdraw their fleet the other side of the Kiel Canal. In which case, they've just handed the British the north coast of Belgium because the Royal Navy can descend on mass at that point and not worry about anything. Uh, or they have to come out and fight you. Which is what the Royal Navy really wanted. Because the Royal Navy really wanted to redo Jutland and this time not let the Germans get away because the shells all worked this time. Arizona and one more sunk permanently, two heavily damaged, and the rest ran to San Francisco. Hmm. Jones, how much damage did the Italian AA do to Ferrini ships? Quite a lot. Um, Knights of Clearance, surprise Dracus another video on the Raid of Trinity. We've all done one as bilge pumps. Uh, there is a whole, if you look for on my channel, you'll find as from last year an entire bilge pump special. On Taranto. Uh, there's an entire special we did on them. For Taranto 80. And just why would anyone want to slow down anything dropping for a sawfish? If anything, excessive speed is not a sawfish problem. You'd be surprised. A torpedo doesn't like hitting the water fast. Uh, surprisingly enough, torpedoes are actually quite fragile things. And if they hit the water too hard, they break up. Inka, did Japanese visit Toronto the raid? Yes. The Japanese at a naval attaché went and did some extensive research down in Toronto. Not a wolf. As an add-on to John of Venoms, how much damage did the civilians suffer? Uh, in real life, there was a concern of the Italians. It was a concern of the Italians, and it was a concern of the British pilots. They were all looking at going, that they've got, we hope they're in shelters. There are none listed as being died on any of the sources I have access to, but I am, as I've said, not always that trustful of some of the Italian sources so, uh, that you've got translated to the English language. Le uh, you know, so if other people have more information on that one, I'd be very happy to hear it. Frank Spanner, did the attacks on Dunkirk and Riclu help with planning Toronto? Not really. 
Mostly the plan for Taranto, and this is going to sound really, really nasty, had been concocted in 1933-ish, 1934-ish. Uh, it had been being worked on in at least some extent, as long as there was an aircraft carrying the Mediterranean fleet. And the idea slowly evolved around the fact that the Italians were putting all their eggs in one basket. And this is the other point you have to remember about Taranto, and this is why it gets often linked to Pearl Harbor, is that to an extent, the Italians and the Americans have put their eggs in a basket, in one basket. But you must remember, the Americans always have a lot more eggs in other baskets and are able to build a lot more. So actually, the severity for the Italians is any ship they lose, the odds are, well, as we know, they have three ships damaged, only one of those gets back in service. Do they build any new ones to really to replace them? Well, they just about get Roma to sea when, well, they change sides. So this is the problem. Uh, damage you inflict on the Italians is going to cause far more damage long term and be far more long lasting than any damage you inflict on the Americans, which sort of pushes that up in terms of impact. Uh, the Amer uh, you know, you have sort of you have to look at the nuance and the contents uh, context of Taranto and and Pearl Harbor. They uh, when I sort of put them on a level and I go, well, actually, considering its number of aircraft involved and the capabilities of those aircraft, proportionally, they achieve much the same level of impact as the uh, Japanese achieve at Pearl Harbor. That's because of what the uh, what the Ranger Marina is like versus the U.S. Navy. The U.S. Navy has a lot of battleships, and they get really, for all intents and purposes, four of those knocked out for the war. Two sunk, of which one they manage to raise, one they don't really. They don't, and two heavily damaged. Rage Marina get three out of six damaged. And they get one of those back in service before war ends. Well, they're broadly speaking, one and almost two, almost the second one. It's, the thing is, it's, it's a case of the damage done to the Italian fleet is going to be far more because their infrastructure and industry is far less. So... The more damage you inflict, the even greater impact it has on the Italian Navy. This doesn't take it away from the feet on either side. It's not a zero-sum game. And please, I, that's the thing I most hate when I see it in history. People go, oh, Pearl Harbor's better than Toronto. Or Toronto's better than Pearl Harbor. Or this is better than that. It's not. They're both equally difficult. Because, let's be honest. Why are, the, why are the Japanese attacking the Americans during daylight? Because they don't have night strike, capa night strike capability. And the reason, uh, so they're going in on a Sunday. So they select a Sunday because that's the best time for them. Why are the Royal Navy, after the 21st of October, having to wait to the 11th of November? Because they're waiting for a full moon. Because whilst they have night strike capability, they know full well that a full moon, moon will make it a lot easier. I. Both strikes are to an extent limited by geography and by weather and by context. And this is, of course, what it all comes down to. The first carrier-based torpedo attack aircraft, a sop with cuckoo, laying an egg. Night 631. Had John Wellham not been able to recover his furry swordfish, then he would have almost suddenly crashed. Yes, and what gets scary is when you realise he's not the only one who has similar issues. Hello, Team Locker. I'm just going to... Peter, love your knowledge, but as I said, I'm referring to the strike fighter mutation, the firebrick. Mm. Peter Dawson, yes, the very original, but it very, very quickly changed. Firebrand.
Thanks, Honor. That's it. I would always uh, rather compare Toronto to Saratoga attack on Rabul. Never get, and never gets any real tension, and could have been a major disaster for USN. Hmm. You see, what led the Italians to decide it was a good idea to concentrate their force in one location in the first place? Well, as I was going over, if you want to operate in the Eastern Mediterranean for the Italians, the best base is Taranto. It's the best, it's the most secure facility they have there. And they almost consider it impervious because well, it's, it, it's right in the heel of, in the inside heel of the boot of Italy. You know, who's going to come here? Who's going to dare to come here? And the thing is, the British rather compound that by adding in going through the Straits of Otranto. And actually, what's worse is because of the direction of attack, because well, they actually attack the convoy on their way out, the Italian perception is that the British cruisers and destroyers had gone right up the Adriatic. They hadn't actually, but the Italians, after that, are talking about how high the British got and whether they did this, what they were doing up there and Ooh, what else they almost hit and it gets there are all sorts of things which are put down to oh you must have seen them the cruisers must have got to there and it was a again the Italians consider it a far larger force than it actually is Sure, it's for the USN. They had already started uh, uh, cranking out the Suezian Navy well before Pearl Harbor. True. That's good. The Royal Navy also had a plan of what to do with naval domination of the Mediterranean in a way that the IJN didn't really have a plan for how to win the war after Pearl Harbor. Uh, pretty much. It, it, it's one of those things. If. As I. A point I tried to make in the summary, which, if it's. If you've listened to it, you've heard, so I'm sorry for repeating myself, was that. Toronto is one of those attacks which is both more successful and less successful than it was needed to be. Because if you wanted to launch a spoiling attack, you needed to do, like had been planned with Wilhelmshaven, hit them with a couple of torpedoes, but not much you dent their courage, so they charge out to fight you. If you want to... However, if your aim is to take them out, then you need Eagle along, at least, and you probably need Ark Royal as well. Because if, again, you've got six battleships, so the number of aircraft you need to perform the, a similar level takeout is less. But also, you have the fact that the British do have their aerial torpedoes, which... And I know I keep going on as a point. Right, so... The Japanese rely on a sort of buoyant nose with a sort of spa a space up here and the fins to try and do that. But what they do is they make them come up more quickly. So instead, of, they don't dive as deeply, but they still dive when they hit the water. The British, relying on the tension wire and the fins and dropping from the correct height, it's a belly flop. So they don't dive at all. Now, if you get the height wrong, they will still dive, and hence there is a torpedo which ends up in the bottom on the, on the bottom of the harbor. It can happen. But if we go into it, there are 10 torpedoes which are actually launched at Toronto. And of those, quite a few hit. Five are recorded as hitting. Possibly another one hits and fails to go off. There is a discussion about this one, and it wouldn't surprise me again. The British had problems with their torpedo, with their bombs in terms of their quality control. I wouldn't be surprised there was a bit of trouble going on with the torpedoes as well. And certainly it wouldn't be unusual in World War II if you think about it. And so that is what makes the difference. If you have a eagle long, then you have probably at least 24 torpedoes launched, carried and launched. Now, if you have that many torpedoes, uh, well, 20, 20, 24 torpedoes and, and carried a long launch. So you have double the number of torpedoes. 
in which case the Italians probably lose a lot more ships. And an Italian navy which is shrunk to an operating strength of one or two battleships for the rest of the war until Roma enters service, and a Littorio which can't be recovered, and a, you know all those things. So let's say they're some, uh, they're shrunk down to Vittorio Veneto and Giulio um, Cesare for the rest of the war, which are the two which are operational most quickly anyway. Afterwards. If they are shrunk down to that, that has a huge impact on British deployments because then you have to look at the convoys and go, well, should I send HMS Nelson and Rodney along? Should Do I have to risk my best battleships with convoy escort or can I use them for other things? Can I put them in other parts of the world? It also makes a difference in terms of your carrier loadout because you start to think, well, if you've not got major Italian battleships to run the risk of or worry about. Why are you carrying things like swordfish? Could you put them ashore and load out with fighters? And before people start going, well, no, the, you know, the British couldn't do that. To be honest, the RN did look and consider about it, but there were Italian battleships still, to, so they still wanted to carry the torpedo strike element. Now, admittedly, that air group would have probably been, if you look at the time of Crete, would probably have been a mixture of Sea Gladiators and Fulmars, which are not the world's best aircraft by any stretch of the imagination. But having a sufficient number of them on board HMS Illustrious would have been a large problem for an opponent trying to attack if, you've got, if you're carrying Gladiators instead of, uh, instead of Swordfish. You're probably doubling, if not trebling, your numbers of fighters in the air. And again... Not great fighters, no, but to be able to take out uh, JU-87, you don't have to be a great fighter. To break up a strike group of JU-87s, you don't have to be a great fighter. If anything demonstrates that, it's the full mark. So this is the reality of what we're dealing with with Otranto. It is a very good attack, and it achieves a world first, and it's very successful for that. But it's both too successful in that the Italians aren't goaded into coming out and fighting the reinforced Royal Navy battle line with a slightly weakened battle line. And it's not successful enough in that it doesn't permanently take the Italian battle line off the books. New IKB 447 and new IKB 4472. For military purposes, does the phase of the moon count as weather? Night counts as weather. Yes. What is that for the harbour? It's different at different points, but um, there is a good book which has all the depths listed in it. Um, it's the Rag Taranto book, I think. Mm -hmm. I do have it somewhere around me. I put it up on the shelves a bit later because I wasn't going to quote it to me. Frank Sonic, do you think, uh, Doxy, do you think any of the pilots of Toronto were involved with later attacks on Italian ships named Mapan? Yes, they were. Basically, uh, there are four squadrons which provide aircraft for the strike. Uh, if you track those squadrons and their pilots, you find they are involved in a lot of World War II. That is one of the advantages. They, they, uh, how do I put this? In the, the Royal Navy was lucky to an extent in 1939-1940. The loss of Courageous and Glorious, whilst bad, meant they had a temporary glut in some respects of pilots. Now, yes, they'd lost some to the Battle of Britain, but mostly the fighter part of the pilots they'd lost had been fighter pilots, not torpedo bomber pilots, not, not the swordfish pilots. So they actually had sort of a glut of strike aircraft pilots. And they they never had an abundance. You never get an admiral go, yes, we have enough pilots. But to an extent in this period, they have a lot of the veteran of the veteran pilots from the 1920, 1930s programs who'd been in service for a while and around for a few years were making up a large proportion of the Royal Navy strike forces. So they really did know what they were doing. They'd been through many exercises, many practices, many drills. 
824 Squadron is a very good example of this. It's it's a very, considered a very solid stro- squadron, and there is a reason why they bring across pilots from HMS Eagle. Inca, are there any records of similar Luftwaffe attacks plan to discover flow, uh, flow? They did develop HE-11 uh, Trouble 1 torpedo carriers that would have had the range. Not really, because by the time they sort of have any of those in service, this is going to sound terrible, but you have two problems. You have the fact that the difference between Scarpa Flow, Taranto, and Pearl Harbor is that the air defences in the UK would have been... Uh, would have been at full alert. One of the interesting things is both these happen relatively early in the wars. In the same case of Pearl Harbor, it happens to start off the war. Uh, Taranto, the Italians believe it to be secure and don't think anyone would dare attacking them there. That the British are planning on that to an extent. So, whereas Scarpa Flow, especially after the um, problem with the uh, <clears throat> torpedo. Submarine, get, uh, the submarine getting in there and attacking uh, Royal Oak meant that Scarpa Flow was not considered the secure hub that the Royal Navy might have portrayed it as. And so there was never really the concentration of force there for long enough for the Germans to really want uh, really consider it worth it. And this, this carrier, Ark Royal, is of course the Royal Navy's premier strike asset and she is built because of that world war one experience because of the research done by the harbor attack committee and various other committees during the interwar period this is why you've built ark royal she has theoretically i know an air group of 72 but for uh, well let's be honest the lower hangar is very good for maintenance is basically her own mini version of hms unicorn but the upper hangar and the strike group she can arrain is probably about 60 aircraft. Now, if she had been involved in carrying out a strike, and if she, well, by this point, she is also herself is full Mars and swordfish. I don't know if she has any skewers left. She might have some still aboard, but I'm not sure at this point in 1940. Maybe, maybe. But she is your premier strike asset. And everyone knows this. It's not a secret. The IJN know what the British build Ark Royal for. The Italians know what the Royal Navy build Ark Royal for. The Germans know what the Royal Navy built Ark Royal for. Everyone can work out what the Royal Navy built Ark Royal for. Because they look at the Royal Navy's carrier doctrine and they go, where does a large carrier like Ark Royal fit? Oh, yes. Because the Royal Navy have been talking in papers, in meetings of the Na- uh, Institute of Naval Architects, in various discussions mentioned in Parliament and other things, the Royal Navy is known. They don't want Peter fleets to be hiding in harbour. And along with Courageous and Glorious, in many respects, she is supposed to be cornerstone of a strike group. And if you look at what they practice in exercises, they do seem to be looking at the idea of a strike group based around three, uh, the, those three ships working together and eventually probably Courageous and Glorious being replaced by Implacable and Indefatigable. Well, ships in that mold at that point. And able to operate a 60-strike aircraft air group and support and sustain them. In northern European waters, i.e. the North Atlantic, or in the Med- or in the Mediterranean if she needs to strike there, or in the Far East. And the Royal Navy knows that everyone knows this, and they use it. As part of Operation MB8, which is the whole wider operation which Toronto is part of, and there's a whole mass revoker going on in many ways, you know, to g- provide cover and to distract the Italians from the British strike coming on Toronto. You've got Ark Royal taking a part in strikes on Sardinia. You've got her taking a part in strikes on there. And then the Italians see her leaving. So the British strike carrier comes in, does strikes as covering a for uh, covering the movement of ships, and then leaves. And the Italians breathe a sigh of belief. Because their worry, their fear had been that this ship 
goes past Sicily, carries on the full way to Malta, to past Malta, and joins up the Mediterranean fleet. Because in the Italian minds, if Ark Royal joins up the Mediterranean fleet, that's when there's going to be a strike on Taranto. Because Ark Royal's the strike carrier. Okay. Sorry, Kaima. So you can argue it was a strategic failure. Too successful, not successful enough. To an extent, possibly. Um, Frank Smith, I'd like to see if the Germans had even had a CV working. Could you have imagined them trying a Toronto Star Raid? I could imagine them trying it, but I'm not sure where they'd try it on. Because if you think about it, if they have a carrier working, if they're trying it on Scarpa Flow or Firth of Fourth, which would be the obvious ones to go on, because otherwise they'd have to go out and go round the whole of the UK to get there, um, they would be running into radar. It would be interesting. That's good. Would Toronto have been better executed with only bombs? Because topside damage to weaken the capability of ships but leave them able to sail, then hit them with torps. Or just the or, or uh, in a following up strike once they've sailed out to engage the British fleet. That's a nice in theory, but honestly, the British didn't have that much faith in their bombs. The bombs they had were the bombs they had. They would have liked better bombs, and they found out afterwards, and this is one of the things Willem goes on a bit about, that none of the bombs had worked as properly as supposed to because of quality control in their construction. The British had faith in the torpedoes, they didn't have faith in the bombs, and they thought the torpedoes would cause enough damage, to be fair. And originally, you have to remember when they're putting together the planning, and this is one of the reasons why they get locked in torpedoes, they are planning for two carriers, they are planning for 30 to 36 swordfish, they are, they're debating as to whether full Mars will take part. It's part of the operation that are being discussed. Uh, John Holmes, was there any chance to follow up the attack to finish the ships during the salvage operations or did the Italians up the defence too much? Probably they could have done it, and they did consider flying the next day, but um... For Bijron's mum. Uh, but the thing is, the weather report came in as bad, and frankly, Cunningham and Lister were, didn't really want... As much as various other people wanted the Royal Navy to launch a second strike, uh, there was a certain feeling in the Royal Navy that the, even the Light Brigade had only been asked to do it once. It, it, it's one of those things which goes around uh, <laughs> the Royal Navy quite a lot. Even the Light Brigade were only asked to do it once, and there are people asking us to do it a second time. Well, guys, wasn't the Idris Hood hit by a German bomber in Scarpa? Um, I think she was hit by a bomber, but not a torpedo bomber, and it wasn't a mass strike. Dear Richards, if the Illustrious could carry 36 planes, why didn't they use 36 aircraft? Because she's loaded with full miles as well as swordfish. In fact, she's loaded with... She's technically carrying 21 swordfish? No, 20. She's carrying 24 swordfish. Three get, uh, are, have their engines ruined due to oil uh, from the tonite. Uh, she's carrying 15 full Mars and two or three uh, sea gladiators. So she's using her deck parking capability. So I think she's roughly, well, that's 34 plus 8. So that's 42 aircraft she's carrying. But the trouble is that once you're in the scenario where you only have one carrier, fighters for air defense at a task force suddenly become critical and you don't want to lose them. If you had two carriers and you were carrying gladi a full group of gladiators, sea gladiators aboard Eagle and the full fighters aboard, uh, aboard Lustrous, plus all the extra swordfish you could carry between two carriers, you would probably have seen a far larger strike and might well have seen... Some, definitely not all, the full Mars take part. There's a debate in my mind as to whether six or nine would get sent, sent in.
Frank Sergeant, let's see. Did the RN have to contend with wind in the Mediterranean by facing away from the direction of attack to launch aircraft like the US ended in the Pacific? Sometimes, not in Toronto case, not in Toronto's case, but sometimes they did. Sometimes they had issues. Graham Hunt, that, that's how they got through and hit the Iron Duke. Early in war, Fortress Orkney wasn't in place yet. But there are plenty of pl German planes wrecked up in Holly Hill, uh, wreckage up in Holly Hills. Hmm. I wonder what would have changed if Gronum Avenger or B5N Cape Bombers were used instead of Swordfish. Harder to kill them? More ships possibly hit? That's actually quite an interesting scenario because those aircraft might have actually had more trouble getting through the air defences. Now, I have a reason for when I'm saying this. When you're considering the balloon defences and the various other defences, the... Italians throw up. The swordfish in many ways does as well as it does because it flies as low and as slow as it is possible and it manages to maneuver and avoid those balloons. However, if you'd had, let's say, Grumman Avengers, which are more likely, they can take a slightly larger hitting power and they carry different, slightly different torpedoes. Especially when I'm talking late war, we're talking torpedoes which can be dropped at higher speeds and more and are safer for that. So the answer is it would have been different. That's the answer. But it would have been later in the war. It wouldn't have been, and those aircraft are not available in 1940 to do it. Pete Dawson. If it had more aircraft, they would have been full Mars and Sea Gladiator folks. Not suitable for operation like Toronto. It did have more aircraft, as I said. Um, it's one of those things. Full Mars were fine for an operation like Toronto, and they certainly would have been considered in a larger operation. Because full Mars can carry the flare droppers, they can carry a single bomb, and they can use their machine guns to rake enemy air defense positions which is what some of the swordfish were being used for. So the early, one of the earlier ideas does use full miles as well as swordfish if they're using both carriers. And the idea is that allows you to have more swordfish carrying torpedoes, because again, the torpedo is the killing weapon. And this is the point you have to make. The swordfish is not the most advanced, glorious aircraft in the world. Apart from in one capability, is she more advanced? And that is that tension wire on connecting a torpedo. It's this weapon system, which is her... I don't know. Well, if she's David, this is... <laughs> Brain freeze. Uh, this is her slingshot. This is her mighty thing to take down the giants. And it works. And Toronto happens to be pretty much perfect for this system. That's the other advantage they have. Again, as they're sli they, fl they fly slower, they actually require less space to launch uh, to get in the run to launch the uh, launch the torpedoes. That's the other thing. If you're dealing with faster aircraft, they need a longer run-in. Because they're going to cover more ground while draw, la launching in. So they have to be flying straight for a longer distance. Although probably it's about the same amount of time. Thank you, I'm just glad. Hello, Dan. Trentalenko. Arc Roar was the brandished sword the Axis was looking for while the swordfish... Um... Struck in from elsewhere. Well, yes, illustrious and the swordfish snuck in from elsewhere. Dejan Jomosik. Hello. I think it's never bad to sink an enemy battleship, even if they can bring her in, back into service. True. That's it, Harry Um, I've seen the CGI of Royal Oak being torpedoed and how rapidly she keels over and capsizes. Yeah, it's never good when a ship's in har ship's in harbour and doing its own internal maintenance. A lot of doors are left open. Frank Sonnet, Dr. C, do you think that some torpedoes didn't even entirely explode? I'm 
well, let's put this way. They launch 10 torpedoes, 5 hit and go off. They find a couple in, well, one they find in the bottom of the harbour. The other four that are sort of unaccounted for what they do. So they might have gone off outside and not managed to not cause any damage. They might have buried themselves in the bottom, but I doubt they'd have buried themselves in the bottom. They might not have gone off properly. I think probably you're looking at about a 30% technical fail rate, is my instinct, because I'm not including the one which went into the dirt mud, because that's a aircraft dropping it fail rate. Sorry. Joe Scott, I've heard, uh, I thought Adrian's Hood was hit by, uh, by a JU-18 in the first fourth early in the war. I've not heard about it being hit in Scarpa's Slope. I thought it was further forward as well, but honestly, I, I haven't done the checking right now, so I would have to check it up. Andreas Glad, Fulmar, would that actually have a chance against German Italian fighters? Wasn't it rather a bus? The really interesting thing, Andreas Glad, is quite a lot of the Royal Navy's best aces in World War II came from Fulmar squadrons. So, yes, it's a bus, but it's got eight, uh, eight machine guns, each with a thousand rounds. And they don't engage really in dogfighting. They evolve that and try to avoid that. They do zoom and boom runs. So it's basically get up, zoom and boom, and break up the strike. Because that's what Royal Navy fighters are for. They're not for dogfighting enemy fighters. The Royal Navy doesn't want them to dogfight enemy fighters. In a nice way, enemy fighters aren't usually going to sink your ships. They're going to look scary and go around waving around their machine guns, but they're not going to do it. What are going to sink your ships are their bombers, are their strike aircraft. And those tend to be slower and less maneuverable, so they tend to rely, if you consider the Royal Navy's anti-ship stri uh, strike tactics, that requires a coordinated attack by multiple torpedo bombers. And that's what they're based around. They don't worry about them in Toronto because the enemy aren't moving, so it doesn't matter. They don't need it. But when their ships are moving, they need that coordinated multi-aircraft strike. You break up that strike group, you break up that attack with a zoom and boom run, and suddenly you've made the job for your ship defending itself that much easier. That's what full mass are for. Were the swordfish considered to be only for train only for training by Axis? No. The Axis did consider them a threat. They didn't consider them the greatest threat because they knew, as I can tell you now, the Royal Navy has the Albacore coming in, which was supposed to replace the swordfish, and the Royal Navy was developing another aircraft because all these things have been put out of the public tender. So they knew there that something like the Barracuda probably existed somewhere. And remember, that was supposed to be the Royal Navy strike aircraft by 1942, the Barracuda. And probably something like the Firebrand in service as the other half of the air, uh, the air group. Andrew Sklet, okay, how about Devastating Dauntless instead of Swordfish? Better or worse? Again, you have the problem. They are better aircraft on paper. They are better aircraft on paper, but we're talking about for Toronto. And looking at the scenario we're talking about there, Swordfish might actually do better. Now, I know there is someone in my videos who likes to critique and talk about the mythology of the Swordfish. And there's to an extent right and they're to an extent wrong. In that one of the reasons why the Swordfish is good is because of the time of service has been in since about 1933, 31, 33. The fact is the Royal Navy's air crew Several generations have run through it. They know it backwards, forwards, and sideways. Maintenance and all these things. Which means they have a high level of aircraft availability. They have a high level of capability of the pilots with that aircraft. Who know that aircraft. And the aircraft is running quite well. And you have people like Admiral Lister. Who's a Rear Admiral. The Rear Admiral aircraft carriers from the Mediterranean at this point. Yes, very soon after the creation of Admiral Henderson's post, the first Rear Admiral aircraft carriers, the Royal Navy ends up with a Rear Admiral aircraft carriers for the Mediterranean and a Rear Admiral aircraft carriers for the 
at home fleet. And they're talking about other more senior posts. And the purpose of, you know, as he would say, he's been planning on Swordfish since Glorious, when he was Captain of Glorious in the middle of the 1930s. The Royal Navy really does understand the Swordfish. So that is part of the factor in this. So Frank Spano, Dr. C, if the French be more helpful, would somehow, would Burn, can he still use Burn? Um, Burn would have probably been sent to fill in for... Honestly, Burn could have been used to fill in for another le another carrier elsewhere, which might have freed up a more, another more useful carrier. That's the thing. Burn might have been sent to back up the home fleet carriers, which don't have to deal with air defense, are mainly about launching reconnaissance aircraft and strike. So you might then have then used one of the home fleet carriers might have been able to be available in the Mediterranean. Hmm. Aircraft at Toronto are, ba are the bandwidth. The torpedoes were delivering message. Swordfish was simply better at low-level night torpedo attacks on harbors. That is what they're designed for. This is this is the other point about the swordfish and Toronto. Okay. The swordfish is designed in the 1930s when she specified, etc. For for long-range night strike on enemy fleets. Preferably if they're in harbour, but also at sea. It's literally doing what it was designed for. So of course it's going to be able to pull it off to an extent better than perhaps other aircraft. Because if you ask the Americans, what is the Devastator designed for? Not long-range night strikes on enemy fleets. Long-range day strikes. Not night strikes. And there's a difference in how you design the aircraft. There's a difference in what you design the aircraft to do. Again, I was mentioning Operation MB-8 earlier, and this is what's going on. You have Convoy AN-6. You have Convoy MW-3. Now, AN-6 is running from uh, to Greece, from Egypt, and technically it's escorted by a trawler, but that's because... Vice Admiral Prindon Whipple's force is um, wandering around doing its thing. And then you have Convoy MW3 running from Alexandria to Malta. And then you have Operation Coat, which is a reinforcement of Malta and of the Mediterranean fleet. Malta's getting troops and anti aircraft guns. And the Mediterranean fleet is getting Barham, Berwick, and Glasgow, plus some destroyers. Operation Crack, which is an attack on Cagliari by HMS Ark Royal, which I mentioned earlier. And this is part of her... This is carried on alongside Operation Coat. And then there's Convoy ME3, which is merchant vessels sailing from Malta to Alexandria, escorted by HMS Ramleys, Coventry, and two destroyers, which means that Ramleys is out of the way of the battle, so basically Cunningham gets rid of his slower battleship. And he's left with a fairly homogenous force of four Queen Elizabeth's class. And then you have Operation Judgment, which is not just the attack on Taranto, but it's also the force going up into the battle of uh, into the Taranto Strait. So it's a real psychological operation on the Italian Navy to try and force them to come out. It's not just attacking them in a harbour. It's, we've gone into your backyard. Yeah, what are you going to do about it? It's, that's what it's for. Decision, if the torpedo fail rate at Toronto is 30%, how does that compare to Pearl Harbor or other carry battles? Uh, I haven't done the stats of Pearl Harbor in a while, but I remember that the the Americans found a lot of torpedoes in the mud at Pearl Harbor. Thank you, Andrew. Glad. Night six eight one. How does the Lamasur PL seven compare to the Ferry Swordfish? Honestly, we never really saw it on do more than on paper, so it's an on paper comparison. It doesn't really get used or 
get used that well. Um, could you just give the French swordfish and use the extra deck? Mm, potentially, but honestly, you wouldn't. With as said, with burn, the odds are if, especially considering where burn was in World War, where she was, if she'd been, if she'd gone over to Cunningham uh, to the British with the free French, um, burn would probably have ended up with the home fleet. And would probably have replaced Furious, maybe? Furious could well have been out of Oval, and Furious could have been. In which case, Furious, if you'd had Burn go, uh, Furious might well have come and joined the Mediterranean fleet as part of the force actually jo going across with Varum. Which could have been an interesting scenario. Don Cameron, considering how much, given how much Emmanuel resources and how much time the Italians invest in raising the ships, was it a bigger to hit to the Italian war effort to sink them in harbour rather than deep water? Well. Possibly on balance, you are making a good case that it was. But the fact that they actually recovered some in the service is the annoying thing. So the Royal Navy would probably have preferred to hit them where they were so they could try and recover them and use that source up, but hit them harder so they couldn't come back. In car, are you surprised by the extent of damage caused by iron torpedoes, particularly on the new issue of the Not really, again. The Irons put a lot of effort into developing these to be as good as they could be. There's lots of effort they've developed into putting and making these as good as they could be. The fact is, Littorio gets hit by three, and thanks to the placement, she doesn't get sunk. And again, we talked about this on bilge pumps, me and Drak did. She gets, whereas other ships get hit by one and are put out of service for a lot longer. So it does to an extent depend on the ship's torpedo defenses, but also where the torpedo hits. and. With Latorio, the Italians were actually lucky where their hits happened because they could have caused a lot more da a lot more damage. Frank's one, Doctor C, how many different torpedo options did the RN have at this time? Pretty much one in terms of the aerial torpedo options. I'm just going, ah, full must fight like I do in War of Thunder. Very good, I prefer not to dogfight, and I now I know it's all right. Yeah, if you have a big aircraft, which is not going to maneuver everyone, use speed and do it. Do the zoom and boom. Tom goes with Andreas Gladden, Dr. Clark. In, in, in fighter fighter air combat, a second pair of eyes compensate for a more modest performance. Also, Fulmars had to fight German twin engine fighters. Uh, ME 110s do, 70s, and J 18 heavy fighter versions. Hmm. In car, who replaced Lister when he went to the Admiralty? That is a good question. I did remember, I do have it on my notes. When I say I have it in my notes, I have it in my PhD thesis somewhere, so I'm just doing a search for it. <laughs> oh. Right then. Ah. Right then, it's Demis Boyd who comes after Lister, and then it's Clement Moody. Hmm. Dennis Boyd serves from 1941 to 1942. Moody from 1942 to 43. And, yeah. It's kind of interesting when you look through it and you look at some of the admirals who did serve in the role. After Henderson, you have Ramsey, then Lawrence, then Royal, then Wells. Pretty good officers. All of them. It is a kind of list of uh, good quality. Uh, 
I would say there is a small issue, though. <laughs> I have a note about that one. Um, there are some issues out there with some of the uh, some of the uh, stats out there available. But this is all the air all the ships involved in committed in Operation M8. So the another point I'm making here is HMS Illustrious is what sent off to do Operation Judgment, but Look at all these ships. There are 30 of destroyers. There is at least seven, eight, possibly as many as nine light cruisers. There are two heavy cruisers. There's Atrus Monitor. And again, if we consider the battleships, when good old Ramillies is escorting the convoy back from Malta to Alexandria, that means that Cunningham is at sea with a fleet of comprising Barham, Malaya, Valiant, Warspite. He's got four out of five Queen Elizabeths. Yes, some have been upgraded, some haven't. But he has four out of five Queen Elizabeths. Is it me, or is he, you know, it, 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 this is what he's thinking. He's hoping the Italians are going to come to sea and fight him. Because if they do, they currently have five available. If even one of those ships is damaged, then they might only have four battleships come out, charge out to try and attack the carrier group. Which is another reason why the carrier doesn't have any battleships in close attendance. So if any reconnaissance aircraft see it, they think, oh, let's come out. But also, for anyone who thinks he's got them exposed, he of course has that cruiser group up in the Straits of Otranto. So if an enemy battleships come charging out, those cruisers could already be moving towards the fleet, and there's reconnaissance going on ongoing from the RAF all over Toronto and keeping an eye on the things. So those cruisers can fall back to support the carrier. There are protections in place. Nice exchange How did Mussolini take the news of Toronto? Badly. Straight to Toronto, even worse. Hmm. Man, I have a quote somewhere. Where is my quote? My quote is written down. Let's find it again in my PhD thesis. Mm-hmm. The swordfish would tend to drop torpedoes from a roughly 18 feet above the water. But quite a lot of them seem to have in the Battle of Taranto been dropping from slightly less or slightly higher. So it's, they're aiming for 18 feet, but in practice they would drop from... Well, one of the swordfish is pretty much described as probably dropping from wheel height. It works, but it's not advised. John Fenbara, John Fenbara, if Taranto is the gate, then basically the attack is the RN slapping the Italians and then digging up the backyard, I think. To an extent, you're right. I'm glad it's helping, and I'm the display. Anyway, did the RN try any extra attacks on the Italian Navy? I think they did a couple of times look into it. I'm not sure if they ever actually... I'm trying to remember from memory. <clears throat> I think there was one, but I'm not sure about it. They, they x craft were mainly used off Norway to attack Germans. John Freeman. I was listening to Bill Trump's and was amused by Littorio acting as bodyguard for Giulio Cesare, as the name refers to it to it, the Semarone bodyguards for Roman leaders. Yep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
Inca, were there any follow-up attacks on Taranto while the repairs were going on? British seem to have a habit of not following up with operations, e.g. the dams. With Taranto, as I mentioned earlier, they did actually consider flying another strike the next night. But, well, A, weather intervened, and B, as quite a few naval officers, including Cunningham to extent puts, and quite a few other junior officers, more juniors to it, even the Light Brigade was only asked to charge once. The thing is, if they had done an attack, the Italians would have been to an extent waiting for them, but also there is far more nets put up. One of the advantages you have to remember at Taranto, and this is something you've got to consider it as a factor, the British had uh, been avoiding Taranto and the Straits of Taranto area to try and lull the Italians into a false sense of security. Hence, the Italians had actually removed some of the torpedo nets in Taranto Harbour because they were getting in the way of the movement of shipping and they're making it take too long. And some of the balloon there, you know, the... Uh, barrage balloons had been swept away in a storm and not replaced because of lack of hydrogen or lack of attention to detail, who knows so the thing is the moment that you've gone to all this effort it's, the British do consider Taranto a kind of one trick pony, a one shot a one, a one shot gun uh, it, it, it ain't gonna do work again so they do it, they do consider doing the second night, but they aren't going to go back and repeat it, because the Italians are never going to be that s silly again. They're never going to be all gathered in one place again. And they're never going to have the defences as weak as they were again. But there was actually, and this is one of the things that they had considered, was they thought that the Italians would end up moving their fleet to Naples. And they did look into it, but Naples isn't as quite as good a harbour for it, of actually Ark Royal both going past Sardinia and then doubling back and striking Naples. But they decided against that one as they thought it might be too high a risk. They thought she might well run into submarines because they knew she was a marked target. So they were using her to draw the Italians away, but that meant they couldn't use her for what they thought would be a likely operation. And that's more what the follow-up would have been if there had been any follow-up. I think they would have done that Naples strike. And that could have been interesting, because if you did follow up Taranto with a Naples strike, then you could have well taken out... Well, the Italians have two battleships there, so any strike would have been more consecrated. And again, I, I'm trying to remember whether she does have any of her skewers still on the border. If she does, they might actually... The bombs might work for them. They might not. Hmm. It, it would have been an interesting thing if it had been able to be pulled off. Am I Italian Productions? Hello. Hi, Dr. Love and Talk so far. What was the Italian published reaction to Raid? I've never heard much about it. Was the info successfully suppressed? They certainly did their best to try and suppress it, but they couldn't suppress it for that long. But they were helped by the low death toll. Only 40 people died convinces quite a lot of people, including... 42, including the two British. It can it makes most people think it must have been a minor engagement and the fleet must be, still be viable and pictures are suppressed and they do all their best to try and hold the information in. What escort did Lustrous have? Why would the Italians send out battleships and not just cruisers? Well, no, it was expected the Italians would send out cruisers as well. But, the, you know, they, they you have to remember, the British are presuming the Italians are going to send out a full fleet. And when I say they're going to send out their battleships, the British expect they'll send out their cruisers, their destroyers, and everything will come out together. And they do expect... This is the thing. The RN's approach to the Germans is they're expecting them to be raiding. They're expecting... A couple of cruisers, a battleship, and cruiser, or something like that to be coming out from the Germans. When they're fighting the Italians, they expect the Italians to bring the full fleet. They expect them to bring everything and a kitchen sink. And probably the dishwasher. And possibly Nonna cooking, uh, cooking some nice pasta. Sorry. Withdraw the joke. But the point is, they are expecting them to bring everything and all the air support and everything they can get. 
When they don't, the British are often quite surprised. When they do, the British often have a very hard battle because the Italians can bring everything. And this is the difference when you're fighting the Italians versus fighting the Germans. Animal 16365, what did the IGN take away from Toronto? It, that was a proof of concept. Toronto is a proof of concept for them. They already have been planning Pearl Harbor. Please, no one go down the old myth that the Toronto happens and the Italian, Japanese suddenly go, oh, we can do the same to Pearl Harbor. They've already been working on that doctrine. They've already been developing their own ideas. You know, they've already been looking into it. But the fact is, what it does do is it goes, hmm, it worked. Someone's just shown it works. And the fact is, the, the biggest impact you can think about is that the Americans take almost let the reverse lesson. They all start, they start coalescing around the idea, well, it's because the fleet was Italian, so they can't have been properly defended, they can't have been awake, they can't have been properly designed, they can't be this, and they weren't at sea and able to manoeuvre, so therefore it's, it's really not a good example. It's a one-off, it's contextual, it's nuanced, it's not going to work. And hence Pearl Harbor happens. Nicole Ross, where any of the torpedoes studs? Um, yes, as I said, uh, they launched 10 torpedoes, 5 hit. I'm thinking about, from my own research and looking at the accounts and various accounts of Italians, I think about 3 of those might have been duds. One, we're not quite sure if it was a dud or not because it went into the mud. That was it's the only one which was found in the mud. The other, uh, two others blew up at different points. And the escort. I will get into the escort. Let's let me just pull it up. Right then, the escort is illustrious, and she's escort being escorted by Berwick, York, Glasgow, Gloucester, and Hasty, Havelock, Hyphen, and Ilex. So she's got all the heavy cruisers with her. Derek in York. She's got two town class light cruisers with her, Glasgow and Gloucester. And she's got four pretty newish destroyers with her. Hasty, Havelock, Hyperon, and Ilex. Oh, and by the way, there's Prindon Whipple's force up doing its damage, and its force includes, if I'm remembering correctly, Sydney, Ajax, Orion, Nubian, and Mohawk. That's what they've got. So they have a force of four cruisers and four destroyers with Illustrious. And they have a force of three more light cruisers, including, of course, Sydney, which should never be counted out, but also Ajax and Orion, plus two tribal class destroyers. Setting which would have come from which would have been coming from behind any Italian fleet heading towards them. So we can all presume that this force would probably have ended up causing some trouble because there's also further back there is the Mediterranean fleet. So there is Force X going and doing its strike, there is Illustrious Force going and doing its strike, and they as you can see from this map. There is the Mediterranean fleet not that far away. The Mediterranean fleet is just behind it. And so they have to race south. The Mediterranean fleet would race north. And behind the Italian fleet would be coming this cruiser force. With two tribals in its number. That's the safety and protection for the illustrious class. Or an ancient illustrious. Take care, Alan Cash. 
I don't think calling your family the of the Axis forces will be would be um is a good thing for you. How much did Taranto lead to a concentration of Axis AAS that's to protect harbors and ports? Heavily. It have they start to move a lot to ports. And that's one of the problems at Mm. Oh, the EP is that the concentration of AA firepower. Thanks, Ronald. Let's see what best stones, what ships, and how many will escort the CV uh, a carrier for the Orion. Uh, a combination of what is available versus what is the likely threat. I HMS Ark Royal sometimes wanders around with just shiny Sheth as her protection. And sometimes a couple of destroyers. But there again, that is shiny Sheth. So, you know, y y it's kind of, it's the town class version of HMS Warspite. Have six inch guns, we'll fire them. Um... But Illustrious rarely goes around without a full escort of at least a couple of cruisers and so, uh, four destroyers. And that's half a flotilla of destroyers. So what you're saying is the Italians weren't Danish. Um, hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's take turn. What if the USA had taken the actual letter from Taranto, not the wrong ones? You mean if the USA had listened to the report provided by their own officer aboard HMS Illustrious? Well, they might have emphasized getting the air defenses of Pearl Harbor set up with radar running properly quicker and more quickly. Remember, there is time. This takes place in November. 1940 that's we're talking about december 1941 that's a little bit over 12 months away a little bit over for nearly 13 months away so they could have done something honestly the trouble is the americans are expecting a sabotage attack not a carrier attack they are expecting people to try and bot uh, you know they're expecting people to try and take out the aircraft on the airfields uh, they're not expecting a huge fleet of aircraft from carriers to come in and if they had been they could have changed things a lot around they they might well have dispersed the ships more through other harbors if they felt they could or they might have put in more air defense around them or they might have kept a more alert watch who knows they might not have double stacked their ships to block them in And as Mitchell Oates says, the USN had no real excuses because uh, USN admirals, in fact more than one, had uh, had staged air raids on Pearl Harbor during fleet exercises in the 1930s. Yes. I'm just glad, uh, glad. Off topic, but including ships going down in harbor. Do you know about the Hoshfun uh, disaster in Sweden? Three destroyers exploded in harbor. No need for answers here, just a tip. Hmm. I do have, so I have it on my list of things to talk about at some point. Rankash, oh wow, only 14 likes. Oh. Thank you, Rankash. Ah. Uh... ESN had an observer on board a lot of in the Toronto raid. Yes. And he was posted at Iceland during the Pearl Harbor. Telling brass what they didn't want to hear has a price. Well, yes and no. Yeah, we have 472. 
Uh, my response to the Americans saying it can't happen twice. All that metal is a very good lightning conductor. <laughs> mm. Dan. Bathroom. Did the Americans expect the Turo Japanese to try to rent them in the Philippines rather than Pearl Harbor? Actually, honestly, they probably did. And this is the other thing. It's kind of like Pearl Harbor actually works the same way as Toronto. Because if you look at this, look at what the Italians are thinking. This is right inside Italy, as far as the Italians are concerned. No one's going to come here. Who is going to attack us here? And I have to admit, you know, there are... One of the, when I read the John Wellham stuff, which I'm going to read, I'm going to read the full account later on. I'm just going to read it all for you because it's just so wonderful. But one of the things you realize is just what a feat of navigation it is. And you can, it, it's one of those things. I think part of the mythology that comes out about the swordfish is also to an extent a mythology of their crews. And people don't think about the quality of their fitters, the crews, and the people who look after them. And the fact that they've been, that this aircraft had been in service for long enough, they all really knew their aircraft. The Royal Navy observers have been, Royal, uh, Fleet Air Arm observers have been Royal Navy for the entire of the interwar period. In many ways, the Royal Navy has used them to substitute when they haven't had their own, uh, haven't had control of the pilots and haven't been able to have Navy pilots. So observers have been critical. They have been chosen for their skills in navigation. They are some of the best and the brightest the fleet has to offer. And the navigation at night of this strike is absolutely amazing. It's not, there's no GPS, there's nothing that, like that available. It's all being done by dead reckoning, star charts, and just generally doing the maths in their own head. Let's look at that. You know, this gives you a real idea of why this this matters. Because if you don't want to go through the Straits of Messina constantly with your battleships, which you probably don't because those straits aren't that wide and can be mined, then and you've got a, and you'll remember the Italian fleet is not considered the longest range asset in the world. This is the best place for the Italian fleet to base to attack the Eastern Mediterranean, to be able to provide forces to support the invasion of Greece and later the attack on Crete. And they're forced to go back to Naples. They're forced to be withdrawn to Naples. Final 65, did the attack get the Italian Navy to speed up the development of their own radar systems? It certainly made the Italians think about it, and they tried their best, but mostly they seem to end up with having German radar systems if they have anything. Mm -hmm. P. Dawson, how do you find a moving airfield? There's a beacon then within range, but still. That's the case. That is what they when within range. But again, the moving airfield, the Royal Navy had told them a box of where the um, aircraft carrier was going to be, and the observers were navigating to that box. And that's what they were doing. And again, you have to remember. This becomes a, quite a big factor when the rotation of the Earth and the effect, of, you know, the uh, uh, certain things move in terms of the ships moving, the Earth's moving, magnetic poles aren't necessarily moving, but they can, it can have an impact uh, to an extent if you don't fudge things. So 
they have to take into account a lot of maths to work things out and get the things back. Nine Productions. If the war in the Far East goes better for the British, i.e. Singapore and Malaya, then how feasible would a Taranto style raid in the Pacific be against, say, Truk? It's an option. But again, it's a case of do the British have the carrier out there to do it? And that's the thing. The real the reality is Singapore and Malay, if we're looking at it from a naval perspective, would have gone better for the British if the British had had a carrier out there. It would have therefore been you could therefore say you have to go back to A, the carrier decision made the sort of the sort of construction made by Churchill, as I often do go back to, but you also have to go back to the losses of Courageous, Glorious, and Ark Royal. Ark Royal could have been saved through damage control. Courageous could have been saved if she hadn't been on anti-submarine operations. So if the people had gone, well, yes, we need a carrier for anti-submarine operations, but let's not use a fleet carrier. Let's use, I don't know, Argus. That would have been fine. Because also if Argus had been sunk, no one, uh, no one wants to lose any ship. But if Argus gets sunk, no one's really too bothered. And... Well, Glorious, of course, is lost gloriously in a way she shouldn't have been. It's just, no. She should not have been out alone and uh, been able to be pounced upon by Shan Horse and Eisenhower. That is not the, uh, not the scenario you should have been operating and carrying. So the Royal Navy, if they hadn't lost those three carriers, then they could have possibly done something more about Singapore and Malaya. They could certainly have perhaps caused trouble for the attack fleet. And uh, for the invasion forces, again, this is all coming out. There's been there's a, sp a special coming out on Singapore and Malaya uh, Force Z. Um, uh, look at Force Z uh, by the British, uh, by the bilge pumps coming up. Sorry. John Byrne, have you heard of String Bag Comics or read any? Yes, I have. I've read it and I think I've reviewed it. Well, I um one of the more thicker books I got sent. The one of the hardbacks. <laughs> Con Cameron, I've always been hello, Sean Mac. Uh, Con Cameron, I've always been curious to know that given up until the Washington Treaty, the UK Japanese alliance existed. How much early aircraft carrier knowledge was shared between navies? There is a bit, but not as much as you'd think there was, because in many ways the testing was ongoing in the Royal Navy. There is a base in terms of concept of operations, and you have to remember the Japanese had been operating seaplane aircraft in during World War One themselves, and had actually used them during the Tsingtao aircraft, uh, Tsingtao um, siege to attack German vessels and German thing, uh, German units inside Tsingtao from seaplanes. So. The idea of striking targets from naval using naval aircraft was not really something new. In it's been done, it hasn't been done to the extent before. This is again one of the things that comes up in history. Things often are carried out in minor and small ways a long time before they become a major factor in war. You know. We, Again, we've been talking about drones and unmanned, air, uncrewed aircraft for a long time. We've been talking about, well, been talking about un, uh, guided weapon systems, you know, guided rockets, guided, virtually guided missiles for a long time before they've become what they are today. They, they're a girl, and they are going, oh yes, these are the coolest of cool things. But the idea has been around a while. It takes a while for technology sometimes to catch up the idea. I'm not actually. That's why there is a true north grid and a magnetic north. Mm -hmm. And they have to work that out in the dark. In a plane that's moving at 8,000 feet with the smell of, well, with at the very least the waft of 
fumes of aviation fuel vapour all around them. At worst, with aviation fuel pooling around them. I never, I'll look out for that, Bill Trumpson. Thank you. It's going to be out as a special. I think it's coming out on Drax channel. Rentaling it. Glorious was lost due to some glorious stupidity. Not as bad as Pearl Harbor, my dear, but really hard nonetheless. I would say... Actually, I would say Glorious is worse than Pearl Harbor. Because, honestly, if you consider it, the Royal Navy has been practicing the entire interwar period, and in every single exercise, they have obsessed over securing aircraft carriers from cruiser attacks getting behind their lines. It's become a Royal Navy mantra. And it's even a factor in their own battle, or their their sort of battle book and their com their war fighting manuals in the from the nineteen twenties onwards, and still, Lord Corkanori allows the carrier to go up on its own with a couple of destroyers as escort. And again, that's actually quite a big problem, because if you consider, the Glorious Strike Group was one of the most experienced in the Royal Navy. And yes, they managed to recover a fair number, a few of them, and they managed to figure out how to use them, etc. But they lose a lot of aircraft, they lose a lot of unit cohesion, they use a lot of people. If you'd had Glorious around, more than likely, she would have gone back to the Mediterranean Fleet. More than likely, she would have been part of this strike. Either the British would have snuck her around with, but uh, snuck her through with Barham, or they would have snuck her around the African coast, which they weren't uh, weren't above doing. Quite happily sneaking ships around, and she would have been part of it. The question is whether Eagle would have still been there to get damaged, or whether Glorious would have got damaged, but. I think it would have been interesting that I think you would have been looking at a strike from Glorious and Illustrious on Toronto. And if, you, if you'd had three carriers and more fighters, therefore, you might have actually ended up with Eagle getting less damage. And we can go through the what-ifs and all the scenario permutations of what happened, but you could well have ended up with a scenario where you had all three carriers available, and then that's a far larger strike on the Italian fleet. And the more stri uh, the larger the strike, the more likely the damage. Uh, the more likely the Italian, uh, the larger the strike group, the more likely the Italian Navy does suffer a permanent crippling blow. Take care, John Evans. Thank you for watching. Hmm. Frank John, don't see what was the system like for the iron to recover down pilots? Uh, they tended to use walrus and sea otters. So they would use submarine walruses and sea otters and they would come in and try and pick them up. Otherwise, they would use destroyers or cruisers occasionally. Down from the Iron's early war losses of cavalry ships was not a time filled with glory, and highlighted some of the errors that crept in, in uh, during peacetime in the thinking. True. Nicole Ross, what's the Gulf of Toronto blanked out? Yes and no. Um, one of the interesting, they did seem to be operating on some sort of air defence parameters, but completely blacked out. I'm not sure. But there again, they weren't, it's not as light as it is today. It's going to sound strange, that might sound strange, but there wasn't the, let's put it this way. You're not dealing with the most developed part of Italy in 1940. Hmm. That was it. I'm guessing. Re-iron observers. Fun fact. 
On Luftwaffe bombers, the observer was the commander. Praise be the observer. Yeah, that occasionally caused issues in the fleet air arm in the 1920s and 30s when the observer outranked the um, pilot. Who was in charge? Holding Suez was even more important than holding Singapore and Hong Kong. Yeah. Jonathan Burrow, would the Raja Marina ever have two fleets or more likely two big squadrons in Toronto and Naples? That's certainly what they would have liked to have done, but they didn't have enough big sh enough ships for that. And again, if you, let's say you divide your fleet in half, then the Royal Navy have four battleships in the Mediterranean fleet, and they might, they could put four in the H uh, four in uh, four in the um, uh, Task Force H, uh, or they could just leave Task Force H as it was, and the fact you use distance to defend it against the Italian battleship. The fact is, a divided force wasn't a sensible thing for the Italians, and the damage force they had for the rest of the war wasn't always necessarily the most available thing. But it was sufficient enough; it tied down a huge amount of British resources. Mm. And Fab, will you review Andrew Lambert's book on the British Way of War? Uh, probably. Angela, you can well imagine people in South Asia believing in that co prosperity sphere of propaganda. Mm. Nicole Ross, didn't the RN have the radio beacon that rotated once per minute? The, fly, uh, the pilot would fly the reciprocal course. Yes, uh, the observer would sync their watch of it, and yes, it would rotate once per minute. But it wasn't that powerful. The Royal Navy didn't have it outset on max power because it could still lead enemy aircraft to you. So it was basically you would uh, you would have a point to get back, and the carrier would be in this basket area, and in that basket area you'd find it. You'd match up the beep with your when you heard the beep with your watch, and you'd then go right. Then it's that way to the centre. And it's actually quite a clever system for 1940. Okay? I have got into this debate with people in the past where I've talked about it and I've gone, it's a really clever system. Well, it is. And then people go back and go, oh, but they could have done this and this and this. This would all be better. And you go, yeah, can you implement that in time? Can you implement that with the technology available? In 1940, this is good technology. It's actually been in service since about the mid to late 1930s. In on the various carriers. It's a very good system. And it's one of the reasons why the Royal Navy carriers are quite so easy and quick to adopt radar. Because they already have power cables for electronics going quite high up in the ship. It helps. And this course is the Sop Cuckoo, which is the World War One aircraft, and this is the World War Two aircraft, the Swordfish. We're talking about. And the amount of people who turn and tell me, oh, they are, you know, this shows. The British have barely developed naval aviation. And you go, single seat, probably within visual range, strike range of a, from HMS Furious. Long range, night strike aircraft. Torpedo, as you can see, is dropping free and could well start to nosedive anytime soon. This from a torpedo won't nosedive. It's even painted the right colors. And because of the tension system and because of the extended fins. So this is the point. Yes, this might look superficially very similar to that. But in actual fact, there's huge differences. This one has an incredibly reliable engine and is incredibly easy to fly. Because if you want to have a night, night strike aircraft, you want it to be as easy to fly as possible. Because to launch a torpedo properly, you want to be flying straight level at the correct speed and at the correct height. And you want to make those things as easy as possible for the pilot to achieve. Because they're going to have to do them while being shot at. It makes a difference. So this is a tremendous advancement over this. And yes, it has been iterative 
development as each generation of torpedo aircraft has come in. And yes, this is technically a torpedo spotter reconnaissance aircraft. So it's technically three, rolled in, uh, three types of aircraft rolled into one, whereas this is just a torpedo strike aircraft. But the fact is, it's also able to function as a bomber. So, frankly, it should be a torpedo spotter reconnaissance bomber. But that's just getting weird. Richard, it's not the most developed part of Italy today. I'm being nice about it. It's still a lovely place to go on holiday. And it's they are lovely people down there. Um, I'm not saying this based on my own experience because I haven't actually managed to visit Toronto. But um, I've had a lot. Of, I've got a lot of friends actually done that, and I've met a couple of people from there. And they've all been absolutely wonderful. Hmm. Yeah, it could be four for Sunday. Did the observer and the swordfish have a funnel and a basket, a bucket to the, uh, and a bucket to put the fuel they were sitting in back in the tank? No, it would drain back into the tank. It's mostly due to seal issues. Frank's are there any pictures of Toronto Battle like like uh, there are Pearl? Uh, there are pictures from after, but I don't think there are any pictures on uh, from during it. There are some pictures from after it around here. In car, Force H was usually Ark Royal Hood of Sheffield, or later Ark Royal Renown of Sheffield. Be true, but again, there's Force H, which is used to deal with, well, to try and intimidate the French into joining us. <laughs> Doesn't really work. How come? How come the RAF with both arms, both fighters, X never manage a similar feat? There aren't the concentrations, and they don't really try it. They're using them for other things. George Newman, USN had introduced the beacon system before Midway, but some of the pilot's crews either couldn't tune it in or didn't trust it. A bit of a issue. Doesn't any beacon risk getting the seat of the carrier discovered? Yes, Hargliff, it does. But in the end, you want to recover your pilot. So it's a balance of risk. So if you have it on a low power setting, so it's not going to guide the enemy fleet in from a long way away. Remember, the Royal Navy, and this is it's going to sound like a, I'm going to make it using the joke, but we all know the German Navy, whenever they seem to be transmitting on their radios, don't understand the power setting and go just to the straight full power. Some of them actually do, but they do seem to have a propensity of people who don't. Well, the Royal Navy understands that dialing back the power does reduce the likelihood of the Rager Marina or anyone else detecting that beacon. But it means that you have to give your pilots a, your well, observers, your navigators, a basket to aim for. Let's go. RDF Bacon. Also, introducing something new during a war when you have something that works well enough is just asking for trouble. Perfect is bad when good enough will suffice. Yep. Uh, Night 681. Frankly, the Italians got lucky that it salvaged Las Le 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 As Arizona takes a 16.1 inch shell detonating and detonating further in tons of ammunition and tearing the whole battle apart. Yes, they were lucky, as I said, the spot where it hit. Concurrent. It makes you curious. Was the intermittent signal the sweep from the radio rotating home being fed into and possibly spurred of the rotating RDF? It does seem to have an impact, and those teams do seem to work together at points. No, uh, Jerry Cron. Well, um, sadly, no. Toronto hasn't been taken up by pop culture. It's been ignored. They rather do Pearl Harbor and add on tacky love stories. <clears throat> so, 
here you go. The yeah. origins and permutations of the plan. Basically, the first time we can pinpoint that the Royal Navy openly admits in paper documents it has a plan for this is around the Abyssinia crisis. However, however, I'm fairly certain they've had it for a while before. Uh, and when I say I'm fairly certain, it's the speed at which there are documents and things produced in that report, which seem to date from, how do I put this, earlier, or rather, I don't expect such reports to be magically written so quickly, unless you're turning the entire carrier air group's officers and probably a healthy amount of their senior NCOs into a intelligence battle staff with all the knowledge to produce the required information. It's rather dramatic how quickly it comes about. And this is Toronto when we're looking at it. So first thing you have to notice is that the strike coming in over Cape San Marveto, their purpose is not to necessarily take out the fuel, although they would like to, and they certainly do bomb strikes. This is the flare carriers. They are dropping flares for two reasons. One, to distract the Italian gunners and hopefully blind them by giving them a huge light source when the aircraft are going to be attacking from the other direction. Two, to illuminate the battleships. Quite a few of you have asked me, how does the Royal Navy picking out the enemy ships? Well, it's thanks to the flares dropped behind them. Basically, the, Itali uh, the Italian fleet is silhouetted against these floating flares in the sky, which make it massively bright behind them. And it sort of is a recreation of that dusk dawn phenomena. Okay, where the light is incoming from one direction and the dark spot you can't see in the fuzziness. You, it's more difficult to make out targets in the fuzziness. And then you add in the Italian zone AA fire and Italian zone guns going off and all those explosions. And you actually make the problem even worse for the Italians. Now. I'm just going. Okay. Derp squad. Uh, my understanding was the Germans transmitted on full power because their radio clarity on anything less cause signals to get statically and become unclear on receiving end. There is certainly a case they make for that. Shomak, you mean 1936 was the time when it was politically convenient to reveal the plan existed? Pretty much. Or rather, 1936 is a very good time that retroactively put reveal it existed. It was then, around then. Frank Spotto, uh, when was the Italian Navy at its most powerful ever? Probably 1940. This is probably the point at which the Italian Navy are the most powerful. That room, the RN have been planning and plotting these sorts of attacks in harbour enemies since the Dutch did it to Med Medway. Uh, it, it's only tools to use that have changed since Copenhagen. Uh, pretty much, that's my theory. My theory is, if I'm an Italian, if I'm a Royal Navy Admiral, and I'm dealing with the Italian Navy. Taranto makes the perfect spot because of this. You can light up one side and come in and sort of strike from the other, and you have space to do the running. Taranto Productions. It's a big question. If Norway is an allied victory, Germans don't even keep some order. Is a raid against Gotthavn possible? Um, probably launching from land. And honestly, if you've got Norway, then you've probably got... And, the, and there's been a big victory there. You've probably got... How do I put this politely? You're probably now buying as much iron ore from the Swedish as you can possibly buy, so they can maintain their semblance of neutrality. 
but that's you buying the oil from them. So you're probably building actually quite a lot of ships because otherwise you're just wasting buying a load of iron ore and storing it off your coast. Um, but leaving that to one side, you probably use land-based aircraft from the RAF to attack a lot of German territory from Norway. Hey, Connor, don't see what happens to Toronto for the rest of the war. The Italians still make use of it on occasion, but honestly, it's not the big hub of the fleet it has been prior to the war. Mm. I'm not sure where Gotten if there is a port of Gottenhafen. Um. Hmm. In Sweden. Uh, I, I don't think they would make a raid against uh, any port in Sweden. They would have attacked the coast. If they, if Norway had, you can safely assume that if Norway had been a win, they would have been using it. Because let's be honest, if you can get bombers flying from Norway, that cuts down their range, their, their distance they have to travel to attack Germany massively. And think of all the targets in Germany they could hit. Michael Ross, would you address the landing problem at night? How was the rear of the carrier eliminated? I don't think they had the friends or lens system then. I will get into that because I will talk through... <laughs> Wellum's landing himself in his account. Hmm. Anyway. Right. So, here is some quick pointers about the night of the 11th, 12th of November and Operation Judgment. Judgment is only a small part of MB8. It had originally been scheduled for the 21st of October, but a fire and auxiliary fuel tank of one of the swordfish imposed a delay, basically, and also knocked out free aircraft for a bit. The auxiliary fuel tank is the lovely thing which is stuck in the center of the ca in the center in the observer's seat and sort of forces them to sit back in the tail air gunner seat. Telegraph is there going to see. Um, the auxiliary tank usually replaced the third crewman and would carry 60 Imperial gallons or 273 litres of fuel. It's always annoying. Eagle then suffers a breakdown in her fuel system. And it's that's noticed on the 5th of November. She'd actually been operating fine. The damage they think took place earlier, in, much earlier in October, but had been op managed to operate fine for much a month. So Again, if you don't, if you, the, the details I was giving when I was talking in the what if video, and I'll be to extent maybe get talking about at the end of this evening. The details are based on if they go for the maximum strike, if Eagle's available. And there is a difference as to what they, what they can do. The British Task Force is commanded by Lister, com uh, who at this point is a Rear Admiral, commanding from Illustrious who has Berwick, York, Glasgow, and Gloucester, and as said, escorted by the destroyers Hasty, Havelock, Hifren, and Ilex. They have 24 swordfish air aboard Illustrious. Now, three of those get damaged by tainted fuel, which is why they then launch 21, and of which one of those turns out to still be having fuel issues and has to go back. Well, mainly her fuel tank comes loose, and so she has to go back to the ship, and therefore they only actually launch a strike with roughly 20, with 20 aircraft. And that's in two waves, 12 and 8. First wave has six torpedo bombers, and the other six carry bombs and flares. Next wave were originally supposed to be five and four, but then are four and four. The 
And they use mainly Martin Maryland aircraft from Malta to look over the Italian fleet and work out what they're doing. And those are the photographs which are famously taken by the Royal Navy intelligence officer who goes to, uh, goes to visit Malta in the back of a swordfish, lands, and then flies back to Illustrious in a cockpit full of potatoes. And they also use a short Sunderland flying boat, which goes in at night on the 11th of November to check that the Italians are still there. JSL, if the Allies take Norway, supplying the USSR becomes easier. Supplying the USSR becomes a easy peasy if you have control of Norway. It also becomes a lot easier to cut off the Germans from the North Atlantic. I think one. I wonder if the breakers were better in for Littorio and Dulio than being sunk by the Royal Navy, which let's be honest, Littorio and Dulio were sunk by illustrious swordfish. Mm, they're all to an extent sun, uh, sunk by it. Conte de Cavour is sunk. Um, basically, if you consider it, Cavour is hit by one and is knocked out permanently. Uh, as we pointed out in a discussion, uh, the good old uh, Gilia Cesare has got cruisers protecting her, she's got Dulio, she's got Littorio, and she's got Vittorio Benita, and to an extent Doria, all protecting her. She is a very yucky ship. Anyway. At 6pm, Rear Admiral Lister in the Illustrious, supported by more cruisers and destroyers, was ordered to proceed in execution of the previous orders for Operation Judgment. The Illustrious carried with her the high hopes and good wishes of the whole fleet. And just before she left, I signalled, Good luck, then, to, you la to your lads in their enterprise. Their success may well have a most important bearing on the course of the war in the Mediterranean. As may be imagined, we spent the night on tenterhooks. The attack on Toronto has frequently been described, so I need hardly go into all the details. The attack was made in two main waves, about one hour apart, of each of 12 aircraft. He's going off his plan there, not what actually happened. And proceeded by two aircraft dropping flares and bombs along the eastern side of Mar Grand, to silhouette the battleships against the glare and to make it easier for torpedo aircraft coming in from the southwestward. It was also hoped that these flares and bombs would so distract attention from the main attack, as would dive bombing attacks upon a line of cruisers and destroyers in Mar Piccolo. What can I say? The Royal Navy do like to wind up people. And they do like sleight of hand. And you can understand why. Because it works. I'm just quickly putting in the timings. Mainly because if I don't do it now, I will forget. Now, I'm going to quickly swap the next few minutes to this book, and I might well change the lighting to make sure I can read it properly. So I do apologize if you don't like what happens next in the lighting, but that's because I need more light to read. Thank you. 
I know, it's a lot of light now. I do apologize. I look like I'm lit from above. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nicholas, Nicholas Ross, us. If the RN had call signs, someone's name is now Spuds. They did have call signs. You really don't want to know what that person got at, had as a call sign already. They'd have probably preferred, preferred Spuds. Frank Lennon, Dr. C, during World War II, did the services ever have a moment of silence for the 11th, 11th, 11th hour, 11th day, 11th month? Even before this battle, maybe. There, it's been around for a while. It's a legacy of World War One. In car, both Cunningham and Somerville seem to have liked to use battleships and cruisers as their flagships rather than their carriers. It makes sense to an extent. They have more space for it. Remember, the aircraft carriers, and this is Philip Vian's trouble in uh, when he's in the out well, the Eastern Fleet. Don't really have the space for flagship level fleet command. Because the one which was designed with that space is called HMS Ark Royal. And, you know, it, it, the trouble is she's been lost. And the ones which are built afterwards don't really have the space either because the air groups expand. Whereas the battleships, etc., are mostly designed with it. Zero Hour was fast approaching. By 1930, as the first strike was being ranged at the after end of the flight deck. By 2015, all was ready, and the 12 pilots manned their aircraft, followed by their observers armed with sharp boards and their other paraphernalia. Most of us on the second strike took up vantage points to watch the performance. We soon heard the familiar whine of inertia starters being wound up, the spit and cough as the engines fired, then the increasing roar as the pilots warned them, and ran them to full throttle. Illustrious Bat began to gather speed as she increased to 30 knots to give the maximum possible wind speed over the deck, the lift, the, to lift the heavily laden aircraft into the air. The natural wind was light and variable and gave little help. At 20, 30 hours, the first swordfish went roaring down the deck and lifted easily before it reached the bows. The other nine followed without incident and disappeared towards the northwest. It was all very routine and exciting. As the last aircraft left the deck, the ship rapidly lost speed to give reasonable conditions to the handlers who were ready to range our strike. It isn't easy to push swordfish around with 30 knots of how wind howling over the deck. In three quarters of an hour, it would be our turn, so we went below to collect our flying gear and personal items to take with us, such as lucky teddy bears. I did not have anything of that sort, but put my faith in Joey. At 21.15 hours, we were told to man our aircraft. I climbed onto the flight deck to find E5H. My faithful E5B was languishing at the keylift. I climbed in, setting myself on the parachute. My fitter and rigger strapped me in, gave me a pat on the helmet and said, Good luck, sir. See you in the morning. I hoped that they would. Pat Humphreys struggled into his cramped cockpit behind me. In a few minutes, the EDO's illuminated wand started to circle with the signal to start up our engines. The crew wound the inertia starter. As the rest were building, I set the throttle, then knocked on the two magneto switches as the clutch was engaged. With a cough, sputter, and a cloud of exhaust, the engine fired and I caught it on the throttle, setting it up, uh, settling it for warming up. I checked the engine instruments, which all read what they should, then ran the engine to full throttle, switching off and on each magneto switch. The old Pegasus was running perfectly, so I reduced the tick over and waited. Yes, all prop shafts were working at this point. This was pre her getting damaged. So yes, she was working.
The crew wound the inertia starter as the rows were building. I set the throttle, then knocked on the two magneto switches as the clutch was engaged. With a cough, splutter, and a cloud of exhaust, the engine fired, and I caught it on the throttle, setting it for warming up. I checked the engine instruments, which all read what they should, then ran the engine to full throttle, switching off and on each magneto switch. The old Pegasus was running perfectly, so I reduced to a tick over and waited. I could feel the ship building up speed and turning slightly into the fitful wind. I heard the leader's aircraft open up and roar down the deck. The aircraft handlers were doing their usual hair-raising act of ducking around the whirling propellers to haul chocks away. When my turn came, I followed the EDO's signals to taxi into the centre line of deck, held on the brakes while wings were spread and locked, then opening the throttle fully and easing in the boost override, I let the brakes go and started my takeoff run. With the ship's speed of 30 knots, airspeed rose rapidly. As we passed the island, a quick glance at the ASI showed it rising to 70 knots. We rose smoothly into the air, and I climbed away in a gentle turn to port and reduce the revs to normal climbing power. I looked above for other aircraft, and Pat and I saw them at the same time. I slid into my slot in formation as we continued to circle the ship. I asked Pat if he knew the reason for the delay. He said that he could count only seven, uh, he could only count seven of us, then corrected this to eight. As we passed again through the north of the leader uh, north through north, the leader Lieutenant Commander Hale straightened up and set course to the northwest. Later we found that L five F and L five Q had started the taxi at the same time and had collided. The latter had not been damaged and had taken off to join us, but L five F with Lieutenants Clifford and Goring had suffered broken ribs and torn fabric, and had to be struck down for repair. Herculean efforts by the riggers had made it serviceable in a quarter of an hour, and the crew, who had begged permission to be allowed to go on on their own, took off only 24 minutes behind after us. We gradually climbed 8,000 feet, passing through a layer of filming cloud. Pat told me that we now seem to be another aircraft short. We did not know at the time that L5Q had lost her long-range tank, when, which, as she was one of the bombers, had been strapped to her torpedo rack. The engine had cut, but our pilot, Lieutenant Morford, Morford had managed to restart it. He now had insufficient fuel to fly to Toronto, and back so uh, and back so had returned to Lystris, where, not expecting a friendly aircraft, they had opened fire on him, stopping luckily before he was hit. These are the difficulties of night operations. There are often people talk to me and go, "Oh, well, if the British could do night operations in 1940, why weren't they doing them as regularly in 1945?" And you go, "Because they're hazardous. You lose aircraft. You don't do a night operation if you can avoid it, because." Even, and this is before you get into all technology. You have to develop reflective wands that light up and so that people can see the signals and everything you're giving so that you can get the aircraft off the deck. There is a lot more than just saying, I'm going to fly at night when you're operating from an aircraft carrier. We'd, we'd be, I've had a question already earlier about landing on an aircraft at night. Taking off from a carrier at night is not exactly an easy you know, proposition. Two aircraft collide. One of those manages to get airborne and then has to turn back because she's been damaged. The other one gets airborne and attacks on her own because she's running late. Frank Sorrow, let's see. How much does the swordfish weigh? Ooh. Again, I have that figure. Now, a swordfish, its all up weight is 7,580 pounds, or that's three and a half, roughly 3.4 tons. Her empty weight is 4,195 pounds, or just under two tons. 1.9 tons. And afterwards, there was actually remarks by people that they are, some of the swordfish should have been carrying mines as well as torpedoes to further impede the recovery efforts, but, you know. We gradually climbed to 8,000 feet, passing through a layer of filmy cloud. Pat told me that we, are now, we now seem to be another aircraft short, as mentioned. So now we were only seven. It was a beautiful picture postcard evening. There were only a few wisps of cloud below us. 
Otherwise, the sky was clear and lit with a blaze of stars. To the south, a three-quarter moon was throwing a golden pathway across the calm sea. The air was smooth, given hardly a judder. It would have been the most perfect evening to enjoy flying, had it not been for the reason of our flight. It had become quite cold, but that could be expected in an open cockpit at 8,000 feet. I asked Pat if he was comfortable, and he replied, As far as might be expected, I didn't envy him. Jammed into the aftermost cockpit, with vapour from the tank wafting around him, while I was re in reasonable comfort, sitting on my parachute cushion, with an acceptable amount of space and surrounded by familiar instruments. And Pat is one of the lucky observers, remember. He's just got the waft of vapour, of, of fuel, va aviation fuel vapours going around him. And let's be honest, aviation fuel vapours are not fun things to have going around you in any circumstances, because these are the things which, when they explode, blow up whole aircraft carriers. But some of them, as I said, are actually sitting in cooling aviation fuel. Frank Hunter, so they were in separate forces. Yes, there were two strikes. Uh, there was divide. It was divided into two strikes again. Because of arranging the aircraft at night and flying them at night, and also, funnily enough, the British were worrying about having space of, for the aircraft to operate over Toronto itself. They were worried if they had too many, they would chuck the, they would get in each other's way and actually make the strike less effective. Once again, I found myself with very little to do. My old trick of putting my mind into cold storage didn't work this time. It seemed like riding through Egypt on a camel, while, a camel while pretending that the pyramids didn't exist. After flying for more than an hour, I noticed that the dark blue fabric of the horizon ahead was torn by a patch of light. I pointed it out to Pat, who looked through his binoculars and said that it must be Taranto, but neither of us knew why it appeared to be floodlit. As we closed the land, the light seemed to flicker and pulse until, when we were closer still, began to look like a major firework display. With some horror, I realised what it was. AA fire. What were they shooting at? The first strike should have been well clear long ago. The boom of the land began to clarify, and our two remaining flare droppers broke away to our right, heading for their zone over the oil storage depot. There was a healthy fire burning over there, so someone in the first strike must have achieved the hit. We were still some 10 miles from the harbour, but at a height of 8,000 feet, it was becoming clearly delineated in the bright moonlight and the gla glare from the tracer. Although partly obscured by smoke and gunfire, it was a copy of the excellent photos given us to us by the Maryland's. Hail altered course slightly to port, and we could see to our right the breakwater, Diego de San Vito, and there ahead, the little Aileta San Paolo, with the larger island, San Pietro, just to the left of it. We began to open out the formation and slide into a well-spaced line astern. Our plan was to pass around and to seaward of the submerged breakwater, then to turn eastwards and to uh, turn towards the east after passing Cape Rondinella, uh, cross the land, then dive down behind the balloon barrage, turning south as we came over the harbour so that the battleships would be broadside onto us and actually overlap so that if we missed our chosen target, there would be a chance of hitting the next in line. It was a good plan on paper. The northern shore of the basin was lit by flashes from gun batteries there, and now falling behind us, the island of San Pietro was spurting flames. I can imagine Pat at the moment. He'd be stowing his chart board and navigation gear in some relatively safe place and checking that his G-string was firmly secured and that his parachute pack was easy accessible. Although there would be not much, would not be much chance to use it during a torpedo attack. His usual calm voice came down the Gosport tubes. The course for Illustrious, incidentally, should be at about 135 degrees. He might like to set it now. He was being very thoughtful. If he was to be knocked out while I was still in one piece, I might be able to find my way home. We passed Cape Rondinella, starting to lose height and turn in over the land. The hull was partly obscured by smoke from the guns and the burning oil depot, and also from another blaze to the north, the seaplane base or a crash swordfish. The ground was clear below in the moonlight. I could see streets of houses like a town were planned with open spaces of parks and playing fields. 
I hope that the residents were all in air raid shelters and the spent bullets and shrapnel must be raining down like lethal hailstones. I followed the leader as he gradually lost height. Suddenly there was a burst of light to the eastward as the first flare ignited followed by others until they hung in the sky like a necklace of sparkling diamonds. This seemed to drive the Italians to even greater fury. The flak doubled in intensity, and the curtain of barrage below us now rose into a cone like a feathered headdress. Above us, high angle egg was bursting in crackling puffs of smoke. If the tracer was one in five, there must be more metal than air. My god, no one can fly through that. Shades of bal balaclava. In the increasing chaos, I lost sight of the other aircraft. No matter. A coordinated torpedo attack was not so important, as the targets were stationary. We must simply get it amidst the battleships and do our own thing. Ahead. There seemed to be a partial hole in the flak, just where I wanted to be. I aimed for it, calling to Pat, Hang on, I'm going down. Okay, do your worst. Good luck. I pushed the nose down. Easing back the bot throttle to avoid over-revving the engine, the speed built up. 140 knots, 150 knots, 155 knots. I wanted to dive as steeply as possible, knowing that a gentle angle would only give me more time in the barrage. We were in it. The familiar red, green, and yellow lines of Tracer were crawling up towards us, then hurtling past. Ahead, they appeared as a tangle of colour. The slipstream was screaming through the struts and bracing wires and past my ears. My nose was filled with a stench of cordite. There was Tracer above us, Tracer below us, and Tracer seemingly passing between the wings. The die was steepening, and the speed building up to 160 knots, 170 knots. We met a barrage balloon. No self-respecting balloon should have been at that height. Its cable must have been shot away. I hauled the stick over the left. I missed it. There was a tremendous jar. The whole aircraft juddered and the stick flew out of my hand. Christ! I've hit the balloon cable. But the wings were still there. I grabbed the stick. It wouldn't move. We were completely out of control. There was no time for the mess. I applied brute force and ignorance. It moved most of its travel to the right, but only partially to the left. Was it working, the airlines? No idea. I looked ahead. Bloody hell! We were diving almost vertically into the centre of the city of Taranto. I hauled the stick, the stick back into my stomach. Were the elevators working? They were. An elephant seemed to be sitting on my lap, but slowly you began to level out. But still curving round to the right. Were we going to make it? Buildings, cranes, factory chimneys were streaking past below us, and then we shot over the eastern shore of the harbour and were level over a black mirror speckled with a reflection of flames and bursting shells. I stirred the stick around and found that I had at least some sloppy lateral control. Airspeed, far too fast to ditch if we had to, and too fast to drop a torpedo. I was determined to aim it at something after carrying the bloody thing all that way and having a rather hairy dive. I'd be damned if I didn't do something with it. A quick glance to my right and slightly behind me was a massive black object covering most of the horizon and having a vast castle towering above it, a battleship. I heaved a stick over to the right, putting us into a near vertical turn towards the target. I thought, that was a damn stupid thing to do. She might not go back. She did. I levered out and after turning 180 degrees and pointing towards the great black hulk of the ship, height okay. Judging from the level of her deck, airspeed dropping nicely. Angle of attack, not ideal, but the best that I could do. Aircraft attitude for dropping a torpedo, rotten. The only way that I could achieve a straight line was skidding with some left rudder and the right wing slightly down. Torpedoes don't like being dropped when not perfectly level. There was surprisingly little flak around us. I was forced to revise this opinion almost immediately. She was awake and had seen us. Strings of lights prickled along her decks and multiple bridges and grew into long counter coloured pencil lines drawing across the dark sky above us. She was giving us everything except her 15 inch guns. But thankfully she seemed unable to press her other guns low enough to hit us. Closer and closer we came, her decks ablaze with muzzle flashes, the superstructure towering above us. Look out! Don't get too close. These things have a safety range. I pressed the button on my throttle lever, felt the torpedo release, held straight for a couple of seconds, then threw the stick over into a vertical turn to starboard. Inevitably, after dropping a nearly 2,000 pound load, an aircraft rises, and E5H was no exception. We rose right into the ship's gunfire. I fought the sloppy controls to force her down, crying, Fly, you! bitch. Poor thing, she was doing her best. There was another jar and shut up. We had been hit again. Hell's teeth, leave me something to take home. Finally, I managed to push her down to skim the glassy surface, open the throttle wide, and knocked in the override. Careful, don't hit the water. It's difficult to judge height over a smooth surface, particularly at night. Ahead was the Diego de Tarantrola, with its balloons. I must avoid that if I could, but mustn't get too far to the right as there were more balloons over there. 
I edged over to pass slightly to the right of the Diego, which I hoped would take me clear of the balloons on each side. I could see San Pietro about three miles ahead. Its batteries and those on the floating pontoons across the harbour entrance were still firing, but were aiming towards the centre of the basin. Tracer from the battleship was passing us over from astern of us and disappearing ahead, scraping the surface of the sea. We shot past the island into the wonderful, welcoming animity of the darkness. We were in the clear air and still flying, although hardly in the improved flying school manner. Would she keep on flying long enough to get home? Mm hmm. Telling us also, aviation fuel is basically gasoline, a substance used by down and dirty junkies and regretted by World War and summaries as it makes funny things. Um, it does make all sorts of interesting things. Night six Aaron, he should not have been able to recover for that. Wait until you hear what it's like when he gets it home. <sighs> yes, I know I did say a naughty word. Uh, to my cousins, I apologize. To YouTube, I'm sorry. It's in the account. I eased the nose gently upwards, took over the, out the boost override, and adjusted the throttle to give me normal climbing revs and boost. She started to climb. I moved the stick. I moved the stick gently in all directions and applied a little rudder in both directions. Everything seemed to be working, at least to some extent. But I could only keep a straight course with the starboard wing a few degrees down and by applying some left rudder. She was behaving much the same as she had when I was trying to attack the ship. No well-behaved swordfish should fly like that, but if she was prepared to fly at all, I would not criticise too much. I swept my eyes over the dashboard. The engine instruments were showing no problems. Rev steady, boost okay, oil pressure correct, oil temperature a little high, but that was reasonable with the way that I had been treating the poor engine. Flight instruments were all over the place, showing wing down, skidding, and a general lack of keenness for the aircraft altitude. This at least showed that they were working. It felt as though we had been over Toronto for hours, but in fact it could not have been more than a few minutes. Since Pat was always the perfect observer, who never interrupted when I was involved with things that needed my full attention, I'm not worried about his silence, but I now felt a bit concerned, as I hadn't heard a word since he had, we had left the coast. I lifted the gospel tube and called rather tentatively, Are you alright, Pat? There was a sound like heavy breathing at the beginning of an obscene phone, telephone call, then, Yes, physically. What is your condition? I assured him that I seemed to be functioning normally, and he said, Oh, that's good. I thought that you might be able to be damaged as you have bent the aeroplane a bit. It wasn't my fault. It was the bloody eye ties. He assured me that he had not intended to apply any criticism of my flying, which he felt must have been fairly competent, as I got in and out and we were still flying. And he had had some doubts about that happening when we had entered the barrage. I explained what had happened during the dive and the attack. This caused silence for a few moments. He had not appreciated that we had been completely out of control and nearly in a nasty mess in the centre of Toronto, nor that I had had only partial control during the attack. He had noticed, he had not noticed either, that we were not able to fly straight even now. Eventually he said, I see. I suppose we should consider ourselves fortunate. Do you think that you can get what's left of this machine back to Illustrious? I replied that there was a fair chance that I was going to try, as that I did not fancy eating spaghetti for the rest of the war. He quite agreed and said he left it entirely to me. I suggested that we should be more likely to find the fleet if he would give me a course of steer, and his reply was that I would have to wait a few moments as all his navigation gear was somewhere in the bottom of the cockpit. Meanwhile, I should steer roughly southwest. I was already pointing more or less in that direction, so left him to do some uh, hunting around the floor. After a remarkably short time, he gave me a course. I set it on my compass, but was not entirely happy about it as magnetic compasses have a dislike of being skidded sideways. We compared it with the two observers, be observers bearing compasses in the back, achieved a reasonable average, and set it on my gyro. I had levelled out at 2,000 feet, which I felt was high enough since I had no wish to suffer from the cold as we had it on the way in. The instrument instruments were still reading healthy levels, but the flight instruments were all over the place, which was not surprising in the attitude in which I was forced to fly. At a greater height, I could have saved fuel and made more use of the mixture control, but as, by my calculations, we had sufficient fuel for at least three hours, I felt that it should be enough to find the fleet or a piece of dry land. 
Having done everything we could for our own preservation, we had time to discuss the attack. I had been rather too busy when over to Toronto to think about things other than my own problems, so I hoped that Pat could tell me something. He could not clearly tell what had happened to the battleships because with Torpex torpedoes, which explode underneath the target, hits are not immediately clear. He had, though, seen an explosion alongside one of the ships, the Latoria he fought, which had looked like a torpedo explosion and exploding on contact. He said that he had looked to be down by the bows. Another thing, another which he could not identify, had seemed very low in the water. He had recognised our ship, which he said had been the Vittorio Veneto. But I had to admit that I was doubtful of having hit, as our aircraft had been virtually out of control when I dropped. He was able to confirm that seaplane hangars and the old depot had been blazing. It seemed that we had done some damage. I asked him about the health of our radio. He told me it was thriving, and he could hear a great chat deal of chatter on the Italian naval channel, mostly in plain language. The word Taranto kept cropping up, but he couldn't understand the rest of it. He was able to get Radio Milan, which was playing gramophone records of the Verdi operas. As my helmet was only fitted with Gosport tubes, I was not able to hear any of it. I just shut up and let him amuse himself. My mind began to dwell on how I was to land this thing on deck, assuming that we found the ship. When there was no way that I could keep a level. Furthermore, I had no idea whether we still had any wheels or even undercarriage. I thought that I might be able to level out and kick her straight as I cut the engine. Then, even if she fell to pieces at the point of, I'm, at that point, I might, with any luck, manage to sliver into the barrier. When we had been flying for well over an hour since our hurried departure on Toronto, I began to feel we should know we should know something shortly. I was suffering from a very stiff and rather painful left leg from having to hold on left rudder at all time. I asked Pat if he had an ETA, any idea of ETA. In an incredibly calm and confident voice, he replied, Oh yes, about 25 minutes. I'm just going to tell you, I picked up the ship's beacon. My spirits rose about 200%. I asked for a change of course. He told me to carry on as I was. It took a few moments to accept this. We had been flying over sea at night for well over 100 miles. There had been nothing with which to check dead reckoning navigation other than perhaps a back bearing of Toronto in the early stages. But he had brought us back to a moving fleet without a single alteration, of course. I had always known that he was a good navigator, but this was phenomenal. I didn't, it didn't hurt his feelings by suggesting that it might have been an element of luck. Think about that skill. And when you look for and read through the accounts of the observers, and this is something the Royal Navy really does benefit from, in the, especially in the early part of World War II. They have very, very good observers. They really do. And if you look at where those observers go on to in naval ranks, they are smart people. Fifteen minutes later, I saw the foaming phosphorescent furl of a destroyer's wake as we passed over the screen. Then, directly ahead, the bulk of Illustrious loomed and became a familiar shape in the bright, moon and bright moonlight. I switched on navigation lights, and then, behind my left ear, came the flicker of Pat's eldest lamp as he gave the recognition signal. A pinpoint of light from the ship's island acknowledged. I eased the throttle slightly back to lose height. Then, as we passed over a flight deck, banked as far as possible into a left-hand turn to make a very wide circuit. Poor old E5H refused to turn to the left any more steeply. I pulled the little lever that should release the LRS to hook and hoped that it had worked. We were losing height at the desired rate and my gentle circuit seemed about right to bring me in line with the flight deck. As I turned onto the final approach, the lines of lights delineating the landing area and the DLCO's illuminated bats became clear. Good. I eased back the speed to that approved for deck landing a swordfish the damn thing was immediately out of control. I banged the throttle open and at once achieved the old skidding but controllable attitude. The DLCO was giving me furious too fast signals. Hard luck. Fortunately, he was a very experienced and good at his job. Realized that there must be some reason for my wild progress and gave me a very clear, very early cut signal as I slid up to the round down. We hurtled over the first arrest of wires, missing them all. The left wing started to drop. Here we go. A terrific jerk. We had caught a wire. While still airborne, a resounding thud as the wheels hit the deck. Then we were stopped. I couldn't believe it. We were, both, we were home, with both of us unhurt. I sat like an idiot holding the brakes on, then suddenly woke up to the furious, come on signals from the FDO. Releasing the brakes, I taxied to water forward onto the lift, where the handlers instantly folded the wings while I cut the initial switches. The faithful Pegasus gave a, split, a final splutter and coughed, then subsided into glorious silence. I said to Pat, sorry about the landing. His reply was, I thought it was quite good in the circumstances. Praise indeed. So, 
This is a damaged aircraft, and it's just done what is basically as close to a controlled crash as you can get. You're going to want to pay attention to this bit. The lift dropped to the hangar level, and we were rapidly pushed into the brilliant lights. I was absolutely astonished at the scene. The hangar was full of swordfish. Nearly everyone must have returned safely. I'd expected that we would have been one of the few to survive. Pulling off my helmet, I heard cries from the fitters and riggers. Fucking hell, mate! Look at him! Look at that ruddy wing! See them bleeding airlines? I followed my eyes. The rod connecting the airlines on the port and upper and lower wings was smashed with jagged ends grinding together, resulting in one airline being slightly up and the other slightly down. Not surprising that I had suffered a loss of lateral control. The port lower main plane had a hole about a yard long by a half a yard wide. How on earth could any aircraft fly in that state? I did not think that anything but a swordfish could have done it. At that point, I would have happily subscribed towards a statue to the designer. I felt that I had to give Joey some credit, but couldn't help thinking, albeit somewhat unfairly, that if he had concentrated a bit harder, we might not have been hit at all. The lads climbed onto the stub planes. Are you okay, sir? How did he fly in that back in that state? Did the fish run all right? Did he hit anything? I told him that I was fine. It must... Been their good maintenance that kept it flying. The torpedo dropped all right, but I had not got a clue about hits. I promised to tell them all about it when we found the true results. Now, here is something more interesting, because this is the results that come from next night. It appeared that in view of the success of our night's effort, a plan had been passed to the CNC that it should be repeated with 12 aircraft. Admiral Cunningham had queried the fairness of expecting pilots and observers to do it again so soon, but agreed to leave decision to the rear animal aircraft carriers. That blister. Tender for plan had been worked out that an attack could be made from the same position as on the previous night. Usually, when an operation is projected, there is an enthusiasm and a great deal of discussion, but this time it's sadly lacking. I went into the hangar, as I had promised my crew that I'd give them more details. They'd already heard a buzz about another operation were horrified. They aren't going to make you do it again, are they, sir? I told them that it might happen. Old V5H was looking very depressed, lying like a plucked turkey with her port main planes on a deck beside her, the airlines removed, and much of the fabric stripped. The engine cowlings were off and piled in heat beneath her. They told me that she would need many new ribs, a new airlines, and control rods, and then recovering the fabric. The engine, which had served me so well, needed a complete check and run on deck, as on my own omission, I had grossly mistreated it, using the boost override for far longer than the maximum time proved in the book. They said that there was no hope of her being ready to fly that night. I wondered if that would preclude my being part of the cruise for the next operation. Before not, as being one of the torpedo pilots, I could easily be given another aircraft. Everything was still in the melting pot. E5H is one of the most damaged aircraft you can possibly imagine. She's backing the service a few days later. She takes part in more operations during the war. And she's repaired mostly before she gets back to, uh, back to Alexandria. That is the other point about the swordfish. There are many discussions on the qualities and the versatility of the swordfish. But the reality is it's designed for the Royal, by the Royal Navy to have three things. Be easy to fly so they can do night operations. Be easy to maintain so they can keep it going on the other side of the world from their infrastructure and industry. And be able to carry a heavy load a long way. That's what it is designed for and it fulfills those briefs. Yes, it's not the fastest aircraft in the world and it's certainly not possibly the one you want to be in if you were doing a strike in 1944-1945. But in 1940, it's up to the job. Georgina, I'd say the writer said something far worse, but I won't ask over an open channel. Mm-hmm. Dan Hoon, re the attack run. So the pilot slowed back down to avoid getting a speeding ticket. 
Rick Sana. Hi, Doc. Uh, hi, Doc. Rick. Uh, hi, Rick. Let's go back from Remembrance Day, sorry. Yeah, it's fun. Night six turn. How the f did he pull off the landing? He should have crashed on landing. Hey, the uh, let's put us not only that, the plane stayed together on the landing. This is the point. The plane stayed together in one piece. This is, and I realize I am. Um, I sit there and said I'm not one of those people who mythologizes the swordfish, but you have to appreciate it for what it did achieve. That is. There aren't many aircraft I can think of which would take that level of damage. Literally have their wing pretty much splitting in half. Uh, and, you know, going different ways and still be flying. Nanroon, surely that aircraft can't have been repaired. A lot of spare parts are collected together. And a few scraps of the original are kept to make accounting easier, surely. No, it's it's repaired aircraft. It's rebuilt. Hello, World War II uh, submarine history with Haiku. Hello. And getting late. Have you read the graphic novel of the string bags? Yes. Dr. Frank, sorry. Dr. C, do swordfish bounce a lot? They seem to be quite survival. Hello, Genome 191. I'm glad you're able to catch the stream, uh, the the, the, scre uh, the stream this evening. And as J.S. Elba said, if this was a movie, people would say plot armor. They would, they would be screaming plot armor. But it's what happened. It's how she got through. And it's amazing. It is an amazing story. It's an amazing piece of history. And it can't really be forgotten. And it shouldn't be forgotten. In car was HMS Unicorn by any chance in the vicinity? Unfortunately, not. She was still in production. She was still being built at this time. Colin Cameron, it'd be interesting to see the list of spares requested for the air group that was issued. Minor visitors when the ship got back to port. I think when uh, when Illustrious got back to port, it was basically a list was when of the list ran. We're empty of everything. <laughs> Just send it all. But this is another thing you have to deal with. There is an attrition rate of operations of aircraft. Think about it. They lost more aircraft through oil damage on this operation than they did through enemy action. They lost three due to oil damage. Hello, Yikas. I'm glad you're enjoying this. Let's give it Hello. Just got on. Can someone recommend a magazine that focuses on the history of the Royal Navy like Naval History Magazine? It covers the United States Navy. Um, it's got about the first can late. Uh, probably. Ian Carr, did the author survive the war? Yes, he did. In fact, he goes on to have quite a vivid career. Um, I 
he ends up well this is uh, i have to admit i'm going to put i've put i'm going to put a link below to this book because he ends up serving in the far east against japan he does all sorts of operations i you know he also gets some very cool drawings he does some service on time mod escort carriers uh he flies hellcats avengers he has a really amazing amazing career there's his own pictures from this operation eagle illustrious toronto And he also tries to land sea fires at certain points. And if you look very carefully at this photo, you can see where it's been altered by the sensor. If you look very closely at this photo. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh. Frank did everyone get, did everyone get combinations or did people who get hits get more anything more i think it was there was quite a lot of combinations um there's some on global maritime history but i'm not sure if that's what you're looking for as in terms of an online magazine Mm -hmm. Right then, there are, uh, well, interesting enough, when I'm searching with Naval Wings, I cannot find this book on Amazon. But I can find the other book he's written. So... I'm going to put a link into his other book, if people would like it. By, it's by, uh, let's, I'll just put that in. So right down the bottom of this, you will find a link to a book, which isn't mine. And this gentleman is called John Wellham. And he is a very cool officer, and he's worth reading. I wonder if this helped with making the case for the AR-196 torpedo bomber in Germany or not. I think it did. Um, oh, I've got it up on Amazon US. Well, in which case, it's a good book to find. If you can get this one, you've got a very good book. I'm not sure why it's not showing up on Amazon UK. No ideas for that. That's a shame, but it is a good one.
Hey, I found it. I have finally got it. I've found it now. So I'll put I'll put his other uh, book, book, both books down there because I've got both and I do recommend both. So there, you go. there are links to both books, uh, both his books, down below, and they are both worth reading. They are really cool books. And as I've got it, the hardcover is five pounds for some reason. The paperback is currently one hundred and fifty-four pounds. Not sure why. I I I I I would say if it is that much, it's um there's something got uh, interesting gone on there. And there's. Kindle version of the Attack on Toronto, which is eleven pounds. The hardcover seven pounds, nearly eight quid, and the paperback is um, thirteen pounds fifty, roughly. But they're good books, and they're worth it. Right, I'm going to turn this light out so I can start seeing my screen properly and answer questions without. Looking like I'm lit from above as a halo. Oh. <sighs> Ian Carr. Sounds like John Wellham deserves his own episode on the channel. Honestly, if I do an episode on John Wellham, I have to get Jamie involved because this guy is, as far as Jamie is concerned, the Messiah, Prophet, and God. Not really, but... Um, he is certainly someone who is very critical to uh, Jamie is very, very interested in and does a lot of considering of. I'm glad, Colin, you're going to need a new bookcase. I always think people should be buying new bookcases. I think I should, me and Drax should probably be getting money from Ikea for these all these bookcases, but you know. Hmm. Amazon US has a Taranto hardcover for $809. Yowza! I think Taranto books are going to be next ones me and Drac are going to have to deal with for scalping. Oh well. Right, so here is the damage assessment, and as said, I use Jamie's list of damage assessment as the basis of my damage assessment, because there is no one on Earth, barring possibly myself, who's done as much research into Taranto recently, other than, well, maybe David Rag. And um, a couple of other ones, uh, uh, sort of those authors. But um, I would, this was a cornerstone section of my PhD. And Jamie, as said, is, an, is the armored carrier specialist. And as far as I can tell, mo every, most people use his assessment as the basis anyway. And I think it's a sensible one to go with. As he's done a lot of work with Italian records as well as British records. The battleship damaged beyond repair. Conte de Cavour. Hit by a single torpedo. Battleships damaged but repairable, Littorio and Chiodulio. The harbour and facilities, while well, the seaplanes facilities were severely damaged. Lots of other systems taken out. Um, they lost a lot. They had a lot of infrastructure damage they had to repair. And you have to remember the damage to infrastructure often is cumulative. Dunder Camera, my problem is running out of places with bookcases. Outdoor office. Um, material, uh, Italian expenditure ammunition, well, had been about 1,430 12.5 centimeter rounds, that's 125 millimeter rounds, or 5 inch rounds. Um, 313 107 millimeter rounds, or 4.1 inch. 6,854 uh, 6, 8.8 .8 centimeter rounds or 88 millimeter rounds. 2,635 20 millimeter rounds, which I consider incredibly light, but it's the best re referenceable source we have, it suggests that. But I, I would argue, and so would Jamie, that both 20 millimeter and 40 millimeter rounds seem rather light. 
for rate of fire and how much they should provide. Either those guns were very poorly su supplied with ammunition, in which case that's another reason why the attack is as successful as it is, or the Italians are underestimating how much ammunition they used. It could be a mixture of both. And 931 40 millimeter rounds. Because if you consider it, I would expect, this might just be me, but the cannon with the very high rate of fire, i.e. the 20 millimeter, to have probably expended, and considering the number of 20 millimeters around, more rounds than the 88 millimeter. I can accept, due to their number, the 107s doing less than the uh, the 12.5, uh, the 125s. I can accept that. But... There are a lot of 20 millimeter. And you are honestly telling me that they fire 2,635 rounds. Hello, Dakasu. Uh, for Naval Wings, you should be able to get a good copy of Naval Books. Hopefully. So, overall, the cost in lives was relatively light. Uh, 23 men were killed aboard Littorio, 16 in the Conte de Cavour, and one aboard Cerdulio. As I've said repeatedly, 40 Italians were killed and two British. And two, were cap two British were captured. So, in operational terms, in battle terms, it's not a lot of lives. It's which is which is rather a nasty way to think about it. I do realize that, but when you consider some battles to get equivalent damage can consume hundreds, if not thousands, of lives. You know, Cunning himself says. Go back to Cunningham's point. Taranto, a knight of 11th to 12th, 1940, should be remembered forever as having shown once and for all the fleet air arm in the Navy, uh, that in the fleet air arm, the Navy has its most devastating weapon. In a total flying time of about six and a half hours, carrier to carrier, 20 aircraft inflicted more damage upon the Italian fleet than was inflicted upon the German high seas fleet in daylight action at the Battle of Jutland. That's the point. No casualties are listed as occurring ashore. On the current, I will still I'll make a book list and go to Free Story Oculus Iron Shop in Durham, where I am down uh, down that way next month. I may build my own bookcase as I need one for my tool books. Uh, that's what I've ended up having to do. And it's a good store, that one in Durham. Uh, Georgian, both the 40mm and 20mm sound awfully like given how much 88mm was expended. They do. Did the Zeppelins ever try bombing Scotland? Um, I don't think they did in World War Two. In World War One, I'm not sure if any raid reached Scotland. I'm trying to think of it. I think they're mostly aimed for London because they're mostly political raids. Because again, if you've only got a single Zeppelin doing your attack, it's not going to actually achieve much. So it's got to be psychological. Um, that's got no, that's not what they're listed. They're listed as rounds. So it, yes, you are right. There could be someone making that error, but in the documents we've got, those are listed as rounds.
Sorry, I just got a notice flash up on my phone, and I'm not sure how it does on my computer, and I'm not sure how it does it, does it that my phone battery was low. That takes skill. I just wanna, are there any movies that featured a swordfish? I think the movie about the attack on the hunt for the Bismarck features a swordfish aircraft. But that's about the only one I can think of. Dan Freeman, I can only think that the light AA waited to fire while barrages put up from heavier and lighter. They may not have got the f uh, ammo restock, just so just had to re ready look around. It's potential, but there is a huge amount of 20mm around that. I mean, all the ships are festooned in the stuff. There are all these other things which have 20mm put in place. I would... That's what it's like. From the number of them and the time we're talking about the attack going on, especially with the fact that there's an individual aircraft which turns up, and so it turns up early, which is why they're all this up fighting, and there is the other strike, there's this first strike and second strike, I would expect it far more to be used. Oh, Cameron, I have a vague memory of some reference to, uh, to the Zeppelins attacking up the Fourth River. Perhaps they did. I, I said, I'm not 100% sure. Um, this is going to sound terrible, but Zeppelin raids of World War I are not really my area of expertise. There are lots of things I do enjoy studying. That has never been one I've looked at in a lot of detail. That was good. My other figure guess for the low figures for 20mm, 40mm, is that the worry of strapping the decks of friendly ships rather than hitting the planes. Heavy A firing doesn't risk it. Essentially. I certainly have a feeling that it's not so much the guns can't depress low enough to fire at the aircraft. It's that if they do depress low enough to fire at the aircraft, they're going to be hitting, them, hitting each other. I think that might well be a factor in the swordfish being able to slip under. But again, that's an advantage the swordfish can exploit by being able to fly as low and slow as it could. Jackals, maybe the ammo expenditure of ships that went down is omitted. There's no data available. Well, again, most of those people survive. And those ships that go down, they go down in harbour. They can find the information out. It's just, yeah, I, 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 it's an interesting one to put in. It's a problem. It is a problem. So, here is the attack, and this is where I get into explaining why what happens happens. Because one of the things I often point out to me is they go, Oh, yes, but they, you know, they concentrate on three of the battleships. Well, A, you don't have as many as you could have had in terms of airstrike. But also, this is mostly the plan for the attack of the first uh, the first strike. Sit there and look at it and go, hmm, okay. Dulio is positioned where it was. And again, we'll get into this. But if you look at Dulio, she is nicely lined up to be hit. And she, of course, is. She is, as we said, acting as a bodyguard for Gilio Cesare, which is, again, if you look at it, is perfectly positioned to be protected. Because if you fly straight at her over the nets, you have to go through the balloons, you have to go over the cruisers, you have to go over the AA, bar uh, the AA barrages. You can't do that. You're going to go round. And this is the point. You don't, you don't want to fly over the torpedo net. You don't want to fly over these things. You want to be able to hit the target. So Gilio Cesare is really well protected. The same is sort of true for Doria. 
in that getting to her is pretty difficult. You pretty much have to come straight across to San Pietro, as you can see here. Conte de Cavour? Well, that's quite a difficult one to get into, a uh, difficult one to get into, but again, some swordfish did manage to thread that needle. And then you've got Littorio, which is nice and out in the open, a protector from everyone. Uh, Taranto is a civil port and a naval port now. It has both still there. So honestly, if you did have more aircraft, what could we expect to happen? Well, I think the next most likely to be attacked would be Vittorio Veneto. And there are potentially, uh, uh, there are potentially strikes against her and Doria. So my view is whatever happens, no matter how many torpedo aircraft the RN shows up with, the odds of them getting an actual hit on Gilio Cesare is very, very low. But the attack on Vittorio Veneta and Doria. Doria is more difficult, but once you've dealt with the AA power and operations from Vittorio Veneto, you could then strike Doria. So here is the thing. Likelihood of targets going down is that Dulio, Littorio, and Cavour get, more to, uh, get hit more. But Vittorio Veneto is the next one, and then followed by Doria. That's the likelihood. Littorio is target practice. Knight of Karen, Littorio survived three swordfish torpedoes and then a Fritz X guided bomb pen uh, penetration bomb that killed her sister Emma. Yeah, Littorio was in many ways a lucky ship. Uh, Dirt Scott, what weapons were the Italians using? I know the early to mid-war German 37 was semi-automatic and had to be loaded for each shot, resulting in a very low rate of fire. Again, there is a mixture. In car, a few more swordfish, the cruisers look like prime candidates. Honestly, the Royal Navy, the swordfish, are hunting down those battleships. And also, again, if you look at the cruisers, you actually notice something. The cruisers are actually more defined by the space between them in terms of the torpedo nets than the battleships. There's actually more space to run up against the battleships than there is the torpedo cruisers. I think if anything does get hit, it'll probably be Gorzia. And it might well be her rather than Doria which gets taken out. That's experiment. Unless they fly over Dulia and die bomb Cesare. The trouble is, their bombs aren't working, as we've been over. So they might well bomb Cesare, but would they actually cause any damage? That's the trouble. Jones, what damage could you do to a floating dock for a torpedo? Depends where you hit on the floating dock. Depends where you hit. And this is some of the comparisons. I know there is. I know specifically which of my normal viewers will make a, be very upset about me doing this comparison. But this is the comparison you've got. You have. You look, you've got video. You've got images of Pearl Harbor while it's under attack. You don't have them for Taranto. And this is the Conte de Cavour after the attack. She is hit by one torpedo. And that is what happens to her. If you get a torpedo in the right place, you can do a lot of damage. This is what the Royal Navy knows. This is why the Royal Navy are focusing in on a torpedo. There's a lot of people keep coming back and commenting, oh, bombs and bombs and bombs. In 1940, this is the weapon. Yes, it's difficult to use. Yes, it's temperamental. Yes, it's annoying. But this is what one hit does with a torpedo in the right place. You get the right place for the torpedo, you knock a battleship out permanently. Go back here. Conte de Cavour. Taken out. One torpedo. One torpedo.
This is another picture of the Comte de Cavour. That is a battleship which has been wrecked. Yes, her crew gets off. No, she doesn't roll over. Because she's in shallow enough water that she can't roll over. And this is another advantage which happens at the difference at Toronto. They, the ships can't roll over. The water isn't deep enough. Not where they're parked. I have to do some stitching there. All thanks to the torpedoes. This is the damage done to Latoria. She's hit by three torpedoes. Three torpedoes. Now, she comes back into service, but that ship is not in a good aptitude. And if you think about it, if the third hit had been a little bit further back, she might have suffered a lot more damage. If this hit, it's not far from where it could cause a lot of damage to the ship. The Battle of Taranto does not knock the Italian fleet out of World War II, so please, no one go away from this uh, with that idea. There is Operation White, where they cause trouble very quickly for the Royal Navy afterwards, because two battleships get to sea. The, as I've been saying repeatedly, that the problem with Taranto is it's a success, which is great, but it's too much of a success for the Italians to come charging out and fight a battle in the uh, battle at sea when the British have superiority of their battleships but it's too little a success to actually take out the Italian fleet permanently from the war what did the Rage of Marina do? They, well they moved to Naples which actually also causes trouble for Operation White because Operation White is the resupply of Malta with more aircraft and this means that you actually have the battleships on the right side to, influence, to interfere with Force H. Force H only has HMS Renown. The Italians come along with two battleships, one of which has 15-inch guns. That's scary. That you have, to, you have to actually think about. You have to actually consider. If the Italians have been down to one battleship, then with HMS Arc Royal and Renown and some cruisers in that group, they might have gone, you know what, we might win this, we might not, but we will stand a chance. Two battleships, no one wants to get them close. Cameron, would you say that in, then that in the torpedo in 1940s, the equivalent of the Exocet in 1980? A ship killer of use, right, but, but perfected, yet as it can fail or can't be avoided? Mm, to an extent, yes. How well preserved protected are wrecks today? Uh, most of them were refloated and either were, set, uh, were scrapped or were put back into service. Um, both, let's see, go back. Uh, Littorio and Caedulio uh, were managed to be repaired. What's also going on, and this is another big factor, because the Rage Marina have to move back from Taranto to Naples. But also, the RN does this in the Straits of Taranto. At the same time as this is going on, at the same time as the Royal Navy, this is one of the reasons, again, why I say this is about drawing out the Italian fleet. Because here's the reason the Italian fleet should go up the sea.
Because the Straits of Otranto, the Adriatic. And if you look at this map, you can see the Straits of Otranto. They are there between Italy and Albania. That's the Straits. Up there above that is the Adriatic. This bit down here is the Ionian. In this area, the Royal Navy has a cruiser group going up and coming down. And they interfere. They actually intercept a convoy. That starts bleating out for help. Screaming for help. At the same time as the Italian fleet has just been mauled. The RN's hoping to bait them into coming out. In the RN's ideal world. Giulio Cesare, Vittorio Veneto and Dora should have immediately cranked up the steam and gone charging out with those free cruisers and all the destroyers they could muster to get revenge on the dastardly British. To get revenge on the dastardly British. And while they're out at sea, that's when the Mediterranean fleet would come on to them and go, hey, hey, you have three heavy cruisers. We have two heavy cruisers. You have three battleships. We have four. We have carriers on call. We have all our destroyers here. We have all our light cruisers here. You're going down. Because that's what the RN wanted. And the Italians didn't come out. In many ways, this is that the Italians do the same thing to the British as the Americans do to the Japanese. They just refuse to come out and fight. The, as we've talked about before, the Kantai Kessen, the Americans defeat that by just refusing to come and slowly building up their forces and then advancing and then advancing. Instead of coming charging out because they've been incensed to fight the enemy while they're weak in their weakened state. We don't often credit the Italians with a lot of strategic intelligence, but at this point they do. Because, we're, well, when I say we don't credit the Italians with that, we taught most of the senior admirals were at this point during World War Time, as we have said many, as I've said many times and other people said, are actually of the political variety rather than necessarily of the naval variety. And they're often not necessarily the quickest to pick up on the British traps, but and it can, tends to be better officers are lower down. But at this point, they do manage to pick a real ISIS and they don't go out. And the force sent to do that? Well, that's under Vice Admiral Henry Prindon Whittle. And it's the light cruisers, Sydney, Ajax, and Orion. And the tribal class destroyers, Nubian and Mohawk. Mm -hmm. Georgian, the rear starboard hit looks just forward of a magazine. Yes, it is. A little bit further back and it hits the magazine. That's good. Would you say the attack on Taranto is a successful failure in the same way that Nicholas Moran describes the US tank destroyers in World War II? Uh, not really in the same way as Nicholas Moran destroys, uh, describes US tank destroyers, but um, this is a good book for tank destroyers in World War II from the US. If you, prefer, if you would like a different variety of discussion. I'm sorry, miss it, but were there attempts to salvage the Bratunga ships, or how this compared to Pearl Harbor? They did. They salvaged all three of them. They did a tremendous effort. They went into straight, uh, straight work, and um, Littorio and Dulio are both eventually returned to service. Dulio just before uh, the Italians switched sides, and Conte de Cavour is well. They look at it, attempt it, and then scrap it. And this, of course, is the other destroyer involved, HMS Nubian, one of the Royal Navy's most decorated ships. And yes, I am using Tur uh, Taranto Knight to get tribal destroyers into this. Why wouldn't I? Two de tribal destroyers are part of the Straits Run Taranto raid, and I've written a book about them, and I like tribal destroyers. They are cool. But they're also... The f there's actually a great debate about using them on this, because... The tribal destroyers 
are normally considered the aircraft carrier's bodyguards. Their jobs, literally, in any operation, usually come down to either they are providing they, they are providing security for the aircraft carrier, unless there is something judged by Admiral, Admiral Cunningham himself more important. That is their job. Your mission as a tribal class destroyer is you will secure that aircraft carrier. Nothing will get past you to get to it. Whatever you have to do to keep anything away from it is whatever's necessary. And that's their rule. Magic Terran, Littorio's magazine would have flooded if breached by the torpedo. But, yeah. However, that explosion could have caused... It's one of the... It's an issue. Uh, it's, it depends if it's, let's put it this way, if the explosion taken slightly further back, it would probably have caused the explosion to reach the magazine before the water did. But as it is, the explosion ruptures the magazine, but doesn't actually set off the magazine because there's water, because of water pressure. I, I, there are various discussions at different points because, again, some of the reports about the damage to the ships appear to contradict each other. Right. So, the other point I'm going to talk about is the bonus is what happens if HMS Eagle is evolved, if this attack had taken place on 21st of October. Well, let's put it this way. Let's first discuss why she's not in judgment. She's not in judgment because while covering another convoy on Malta on 12th October, she's damaged by near misses from SM-79s based in Sicily. The damage to her aviation fuel system is not immediately apparent. And she actually covers another convoy uh, later in the month, including taking part in an attack on Maltazina seaplane base in Ro on Rhodes on 27th of October. So she was in operation less than, well, let's be honest, the 27th. Two weeks, a letter before. She's in operation still. Um, four of her swordfish from 824 Squadron are disembarked early and flown to Fuka Landing Ground for a night attack on Tobruk Harbour. And the, they, uh, <clears throat> uh, well, the 824 Squadron uh, attacked the distracted defences with 250 pound bombs while the 12 hour swordfish laid mines. Again, the Royal Navy using. Bombing a swordfish to distract uh, the Italian defences or enemy defences while other swordfish do other naughty things is becoming quite a standard practice they have going on even before Taranto. 20th of October, Eagle and the rest of the Mediterranean fleet patrolled off the west coast of Greece for a few days, hoping to intercept the Italian navy. Again, no contact was made. And it's only on the 5th of November, six days before this operation, that when she's examined, they admit that her aviation fuel system is leaking and requires repairs. Therefore, aircraft of uh, uh, aircraft are transferred from her to Illustrious to re re reinforce the Illustrious Air Group for Operation Judgment. And Eagle herself actually ends up covering multiple convoys to Greece and Malta during the rest of November. She's back in operation a few days later. So it's one of those not what if moments it's one of those well if anything if history goes any slightly different way you could well have had eagle involved in the strike as well and that could make a difference in the attack because let's say they go with just the swordfish based attack and they're going from illustrious and eagle well they could go with 15 to 18 aircraft from each carrier if they go with 18 from each carrier, and that's, let's say they get max, you know, they do max out and they do get 18, 18 swordfish from each carrier, that's 36 strike aircraft rather than 20. That's probably 24, between 20 and 24 torpedoes. That is a big thing when we think about it, because 
Here is the maximum paper on paper attack the RN could have launched. And the maximum attack group is 36 swordfish and 9 full mars. Now, there are various strikes based around 30 swordfish, and there are 36 swordfish, and there are the 36 swordfish and 9 full mars. So, this is the maximal on paper strike versus the reality. And that's what I want you to think about because. I want you to think about not what might have been, but what might have been if it, on what is my, possible on paper versus what is possible in reality. That's got. Did Eagle know about the damage to the aviation resource system prior to fifth and couldn't cover it any longer, or was it first discovered on the fifth? Um, officially, it's listed as the latter. I'm thinking it could well have been the former. I think they were trying to repair it themselves. Nikoros, I wouldn't be quite that bad. I'd probably mention if some of the carriers or the, the carriers or battleships by name, if along with the tribal. Um Inkar, Adrus Fiegel the only two funnel carrier? I'm not sure about that. I'm fairly sure our, uh, Queen the current Queen of Lilith and um, Prince of Wales have two funnels. For some reason. In car was Eagle a much more capable ship than Hermes? Yes. A much more capable ship than Hermes. So, as we know, Illustrious is goes into this operation with 24 swordfish, but three of them get damaged, so she's down to 21 swordfish. She, three of them get damaged with fuel. She launches a 12 aircraft, 9 aircraft, and then only one of those, as we've been talking about, LQ5, L5Q, has to go back, and therefore only 20 aircraft actually attack. So results in 10 torpedo attacks. I've discounted the bombs because I'm presuming I'm not going to change history by going, the bombs suddenly work. I'm, the, the bombs, some of the bombs might have worked. You never know. They might have found a few bombs which actually worked in the pile. But as it is, I'm just discounting them and not ignoring the damage. Um, just left the oil tanks put on fire again by diving. So, with 10 attacks, they try once on Conte de Cavour, and she's hit by one. Andrew Dore is targeted twice and is hit no times. Dulio is attacked, is fired, attacked once and hit once. Vittorio is hit by three of four. Vittorio Venito hit by zero of two, and Gilio Cesare hit by zero of zero. Now, I had a bit of fun with this one because I did it by some dice work and I got some friends to work on various computer responses. So this is not scientific, but it's as scientific as I could make it within the time allowed and with some friends helping out. So thank you very much to those people. They know who they are. They've asked not to be mentioned by name, so I'm not, but they know who they are. Thank you very much for running computer simulations because, as you all know, my tower is still not working and I didn't want to try and do this on the laptop. So thank you very much. And so it the simulation done by Dice on board and by computer simulation roughly accounts for about 50 attempts. Uh, and the average came out as Conte de Cavour hit by two of two. <laughs> Andre Doria hit by one of four. Dulio hit by two of two. Littorio hit by six of nine. There's actually a debate at that point at where how many until she blows up. And um, this is the other thing. Usually, when it's less than six, she a there are less attacks made because she gets blown up, and b those attacks start to focus on the cruisers if they don't. So that's the the variable at play. It's also the variable at play that Gilea says right. We pre we pre uh, suppose that the bat the cat of the swordfish as the basis were targeting the carriers. Now the thing uh, the targeting the battleships. Now the thing that might have changed is if they realise they can't get Gilio Cesare, which they might have realised they couldn't. They could well end up targeting the cruisers. So you could end up with four, possibly five torpedoes targeted on those cruisers with results on that. But we didn't really factor that in. Are we are we. Uh, we focused the targeting where they're supposed to focus it, on the battleships. And this is based on 24 torpedo attacks rather than 10. 
This is HMS Eagle present and full air groups on both carriers. This is the reality of what months of fighting a war and the operations already carried out equals. This is the paper attack. This is the reality. This is the what might have been. This is the reality. Did the RN have the US surplus turtle feeder then and it was fitted to their bombs? No, they had their own problems. Silly Manacots. Hello, silly. I don't think I've seen you so far this evening. What's the raid an opportunity to take in or an opportunity missed? Wouldn't postponing attack until more force could be gathered provide better results, or was the immediacy of the plan against too good to ignore? Well, that's the thing. Cunningham has already put it off on the 21st of October because of a fire in HMS Illustrious. So he's put that off, and then he's going for this as his last date. He he wants to get it while the Italian fleet is still all together. And before they can interfere too much in Greece. That's the plan. Because they know Greece is hotting up and they want to stop the Italian fleet being a factor in Greece. And that's the fact. That's what they're trying to do. Colin Cameron. Were there any RAF bombers based in North Africa that could have been sent in supporting raid via Malta if needed? Um, or was this too much of a security risk to be tried? Uh, a bit of the latter, but also very few bombers, uh, bombers and they were needed for other things. And also, it's the logistics of supporting them. Night 6 one If Latoria's 15-inch gun magazine blows, that would maybe damage the barrage balloons and anti-torpedo nettings. It would have damaged a lot more. It's actually one of the interesting things is if Latorio's, and if we go back to this map, you'll see. Basically, my functioning theory is if Latorio does get her 15-inch magazine hit by any of those hits of the torpedoes, then Gilio Cesare gets damage from that as well. So there might well be, she might be, let's put it this way. Under those scenarios, pretty much all these ships are out of action for months, if not permanently out of action. And I don't see it as hard to think it actually could be all of them out of action. And the Italians trying to repair them and sucking even more of their industry into trying to repair them because they can't build the new ones. But. Uh, the Gilead Cesare, as I said, is just very, very difficult to, uh, to hit with torpedoes. But if you blow up Littorio, you could cause damage. You could cause damage to her. And as said, if that happens early enough, if the fourth or fifth torpedo, the hit does that, then the rest of those targets and perhaps the targets, uh, the torpedoes targeted on Cesare, could get targeted on Gioza. And Zara uh, and Gioza and Fiume. Again, Zara's pretty difficult to hit. But Fiume and Gyoza could be targeted. And if they manage to hit them, uh, then you are dealing with a much reduced Italian fleet. Dan Freeman. The trouble is, what do they have that can fly that's in range? And where is it based? And can it be moved there? Or is it doing other things? That's the trouble, Dan. So your, your statement was, I'm still not clear why the RF weren't tasked with mining the entrance to Taranto the same night with everything they could fly. Even with early World War II levels of accuracy, they should still be able to hit the seat. They could do. And they could do a very good job of mining. But they didn't have the aircraft in range that could do that. First squad. Would worsening weather as winter sets in be another consideration for Cunningham to go ahead with Lustrous alone, rather than wait for Eagle to be repaired? Uh, yes and no. The Mediterranean worsening weather is true, but it's more a case of how long will they have to wait till the next full moon. Grozia. Hmm. Grozia. Hmm. So really, the point of this is the lesson from Taranto is you go to war with what you have available, not what you have. And we've often talked about if you don't have ships, if you don't have on bilge pumps and various other things, the ships built on your list, that's got what you have. What you're building, you don't have until you have it. There's no point planning for what you might have. You have to plan for what you actually have. Well, in reality, you have to plan for what you actually have available. Because 
If you launch it on the 21st of October, Eagle takes part. If the full moon had been a few nights later and or they'd admitted possibly they needed help fixing these things earlier than the 5th of November and got Eagle working properly, she could have taken part. You'd have more swordfish at the very least. The lowest level you'd have dealt with from two carriers would have been 30 swordfish. Okay? 30 swordfish. Of which you're probably dealing with at least 16 torpedo bombers. So an 8 to 7 ratio. Which is a six more torpedoes involved. You get up to 36. Well, the odds are it's getting up to 20, 24 torpedo bombers, depending on how they go. They don't really think they need more than six or seven. Um, six or seven bombing flare aircraft. They don't think they don't want to waste themselves on that one because they do have some idea about the issues of their bombs. But also, they don't see them as capable of taking out the battleships. And taking out the battleships is what matters. Why does taking out the battleships matter? Because if you take out the battleships, you take out a whole level of threat. You take out the battleships, you take out the level of threat that battleships offer. And then if you think about it from a Royal Navy perspective, if you take out the Italian battleships, what do you then need fleet-wise in operations? You probably need aircraft carriers for air defense, but the aircraft carriers can carry less attack aircraft and concentrate on fighters because they're operating around air defense. Uh, you can probably get rid of needing to have your mo most modern battleships in the Mediterranean. Why do you need Queen Elizabeth in the Mediterranean if the, uh, if the Italians have only got heavy cruisers? You can probably make do with an R-Class. If you think about it, if Toronto goes as successfully, it's kind of the same as if Scharnhorst and Nisenau got ambushed by, I don't know, renown, instead of just Renown on her own, Rep Renown, Repulse, and Hood. If they got ambushed by three battlecruisers instead of one, and they managed to slam in the far, uh, slam in just as accurate as Renown does, then you could uh, then the Germans lose their large surface threat until Bismarck comes into service, which coincidentally is around about the same time as Taranto takes place. But then the Germans would have one battleship in service, and that's not going to require as many heavy ships of the Royal Navy to watch and counter as Free does. And it's the same with Gibra with the Italian fleet. If you take out the the more Italian battleships, you take out the less the Royal Navy has to commit heavy ships to the Mediterranean. Which means the less heavy ships they have going into the range of enemy aircraft, the less likely wear and tear they're going to put on enemy ships, and the more they can gather them in other places around the world. So if you want to build up a fleet in the eastern, let's say in the Indian Ocean, nice and safe so it can go in the surge into the Mediterranean if it's needed for operations, but can sit in the Indian Ocean to deter the Japanese in the Far East, you can do that if you've taken out the Italian fleet. So this is why we describe Taranto as a victory, because it damages ships and it does create a lot of damage for what it, for what it costs, and it does buy time, but not really enough of victory because, well, if they've taken out more of the Italian ships, then you could well have had a fleet sitting in the eastern in the eastern in the Indian Ocean. Uh, again, do you need HMS Ark Royal sitting around at the cornerstone of Force H if the Italians have lost more of these ships? Or can you afford to get by with another carrier? Can you send Ark Royal out to the Indian Ocean? Again, keeping us safe from enemy submarines, but also giving you a presence in the Far East. Don Khan, 
So if the Torio had went up, do you think it would have been done more or less damage uh, more or less damage than the clan Fraser did increase? Uh probably about the same level. John Evans, if Courageous hadn't been sunk and Glorious had remained with the Med Fleet, would she have been as feared as the Ark Royal, making the operation harder? Probably not as feared as the Ark Royal. And probably the they would have still been focused on her. They would have still been focused on the Ark Royal. But also, you might have seen... It's going to sound strange. You might have had to see a more elaborate Mask of Oka. It might have been that uh, Glorious goes off to do in one task force as if she's covering a convoy to crease, and then Illustrious goes out covering the fleet movement, so it looks like they're separate operations going on. They had a count with a way. Dan Freeman, according to Wikipedia, not checked other sources, Bismarck only fired her guns for the first time in late November 1940. Yeah, she's technically commissioned in August 1940, but um, as we all know, a ship, uh, even when it's been commissioned technically, is still not actually probably up to service. Nicole Ross, roughly how many torpedoes did RN carriers carry to the number of torpedo planes? I ratio torpedo planes. This gives reloads, follow on strikes. I have the notes somewhere here. The capacity was forty five torpedoes in HMS Illustrious, so that's enough to arm her strike group almost twice over. If you consider she's carrying twenty four torpedo a uh, twenty four swordfish as she normally is on um, and can at maximum that's and considering they won't all probably be carrying torpedoes that's probably two to three strikes uh two hundred and fifty times five hundred pound s a p bomb the sap bombs that's semi armor piercing bombs four hundred two hundred fifty pounds semi armor piercing bombs two hundred fifty two hundred fifty pound B bombs, a hundred hundred pound AS anti-submarine charges, and six hundred twenty pound bombs. Now that's also design capacity. You have to remember the capacity was constructed around 45 18 inch propulsion bodies. The warheads were stored separately under armored mantlet. Now, the thing is, as Jamie and I would often say, they do have slightly more space for warheads, and propulsion bodies could be stuck elsewhere if necessary, uh, which can have an impact on how many you can carry. And also, the theoretical capacity was also that if she was loaded up entirely with swordfish, she could carry 45 swordfish, and therefore she could arm them all, or 45 to 48 swordfish, she could arm them all with torpedoes. I think she... I, I would say, I'm judging by other accounts during the war, that if 45 torpedoes is probably the minimum she's carrying. My inkling would be a little bit more than that. So 
that's good. Uh, as follow up to Nakora Caution, I will sort of cover that. How many did the paperwork say they had, and how many found their way on board hiding away in corridors? Like, well, as said, it's technically she carries 45 bodies and 45 warheads stored separately. The 45 warheads being stored in a special section magazine. You have a capacity for a few more warheads, you know, just in case of maintenance issues, in case you find that you have a dud warhead. Because you do do testing and try and check and make sure you don't have a dud one. And they have to sort of occasionally be calibrated. So, um, you know, and maybe some extra bodies appear somewhere. They're, they're supposed to be all stored in one place, but, you know, you might spread them out around the ship just in case you get a you get hit or something. You want them, some bodies to survive. So, yeah. B-1900 probably. Did our end carriers have low frequency homing beacons at this point of war? As we, hello, we did cover this. Uh, hello. I presume you missed the earlier section when covering this, but happy to answer it again. Yes, they did. In fact, they had them since the mid to late 1930s. Different carriers had them introduced at different times. Ark Royal has hers practically from new, if I remember correctly. Um, Graham Handler. If Toronto comes off as planned, then as you said, more ships available for other things. Maybe then the Bismarck meets different ships. Oh yes. Um, this is the this is another point. If if this happens, then maybe some of the Queen Elizabeth class actually go to the far uh, go to the Indian Ocean. But some of the Queen Elizabeth class might well come back to the UK. In which case, instead of Hood and Prince of Wales. Bismarck might bump into HMS Warspite and HMS Malaya. And we can all work out what might have happened then. Because let's be honest, Warspite and Malaya versus Bismarck and Prince Jürgen. Yes, Bismarck is good. But is she going uh, to... She's then fighting two battleships, worked up battleships, rather than one tired battlecruiser and one not quite worked up battleship. It's a different scenario. Dan Freeman, stop trying to make me laugh. John Evans, how do you test a warhead? Bang, that one worked. Actually, you, they had some instruments and they would try and test them and check the caliber. Uh, they were testing and checking the duplex pistols, okay? The calibration of the magnetic pistols. They did some work on trying to test them. Conkham, that actually makes an interesting alternate history. Taranto is a complete success, so there's an Indian sea fleet based around the Ark, um, which is available to, uh, to, ch uh, to chase down Bismarck. Is the hood even with the home fleet? It might not. In that scenario, the hood might be have been sent for her refit in the far east. In probably, if I was going to send hood for refit and to technically be part of the far east squadron, I would uh, Indian Ocean squadron. I'd probably send her to not Trim Comali, but maybe Bombay. They've got some. They they have got some facilities in Bombay and uh, Bombay that they could possibly use for her. And yeah. As said, if you have a different fleet, you it's all... the only change you're talking about is HMS Eagle being available. Even if you're going for the thirty, the minimum, the minimum number of swordfish strike, you have a big, you have probably a big change because you don't just take them out now; they are not a lots of factor down the road. So if you think about it, there are operations where Nelson and Rodney are needed to escort convoys. Well, why would you be risking your big 16-inch battleships to escort convoys in the Mediterranean if the enemy don't have any battleships to risk your fleet with? Or if they just have Gilio Cesare, well, that, they have Gilio Cesare. That's, that, that's a powerful ship, but it's a single battleship. So what do you need? A couple of ours? They can deal with Gilio Cesare. Surely? You know?
it is the one which ends up going and uh, going and serving with the Russians as um, the Novoroska and the sunk by explosion in 1955. But as after her reconstruction, she is armed with 10 12.6 inch guns. So yeah, she's got 12.6 inch guns. A couple of ours. They have 16, 15 inch guns. Does she really want to tangle them? Probably not. If you do lose an R to anti aircraft, to air attack, you are probably less worried than if you lose Nelson or Rodney. Mm -hmm. Abazaski, no, they would have sent out a pair, so probably. Considering how often they go hunting together, it would have been War Spite and Malaya, probably. Let's be honest, if they're if they're there, that's what's there. And War Spite would go to the active war zone. That's where they should be sent. John Evans, Ark Royal with 4C would be interesting. The other option you have, of course, is also, is Admiral Cunningham still left in charge of the Mediterranean fleet, or is he moved elsewhere earlier? Because he goes back to become the first Sea Lord after the Mediterranean's been stabilised. Well, if the Italians have lost this number of ships, might you move him earlier? So in which case, when PQ-17 happens, you might have Cunningham in charge rather than Pound. And of course, he would have a different fleet. In it, it, it could be interesting. There's God. Send Hood to the US for refit. Transit through Panama Canal and South Australia before going into the Indian Ocean? Potentially. That is a potential option. She could have gone to America for refit. B-19 Enterprise, on a US CV CVN, the weapon bomb assembly area is on the mess decks. Missiles are sent to the roof, partially assembled, depending upon the type. Yeah, that's the American system. British, Britain, we tend to assemble them in the magazines and move them up complete. Or just outside the magazines. That mean, Malaya and Baron would be less vulnerable to exploitation of their upgraded, uh, their upgraded, unupgraded AA in the far north compared to places like the Mediterranean or South China Sea. Well, the other point you have to make about, you have to think about it, is if you don't have less cool on the battleships for the Mediterranean, you have more of an opportunity to refit them with AA because, well, they're available. They're close to the home fleet. You can bring them in. You can refit their AA. You could send them to America. You could. Do all the things you want to do and actually get them refitted and ready to go. Right then. It's almost been four hours, so um <sighs> I knew this was gonna appear at roughly the four hour mark. So I hope you've all had enough fun time. Let's answer the question. Any last questions? Because I'll go in and put the doggies to bed then. And um yes, today was of course the November the eighty first anniversary of the Battle of Toronto. 14th of November, we'll be having Brew Ship 60. On the 15th of November, it's Guadalcanal and Armchair Admirals. On the 18th of November, it's Patreon 36, evaluating the RN, RAN, and RCN T26 frigates against their World War II ship classes. And 21st of November, Brew Ship 61. 25th of November, Patreon 35, repair ships from the Age of Sail, if any. Brew Steam and Steel, the Camacha and the USS Vulcan to the future. We're looking at that. And then 28th of November, we have Brew Ship 62. On the 16th of November, we're looking at Sherman's March to the Sea in a Long Patrol. I hope you're going to enjoy that. There should be another Long Patrol come out probably Saturday morning, which is one I've been talking about for a while from last week's live. And I hope you've enjoyed the streams. And there's also going to be 23rd of November, the sinking of HMS Royal Apindi. Night exception, HMS Eagle being in the raid on Toronto is a perfect example of the butterfly effect. Yes.
Dan Freeman, I thought part of the lack of air was not enough being built. Mm, that's part of it, but mostly, uh, but also a large chunk of it is where are they when they can be repaired and refitted. And by the time they can get back, there is a lack of AA. But if you have the battleships closer to home in the 19... Uh, in, uh, in the order just about to send them out to the Far East, you might well upgrade their AA. Concurrent. Uh, interesting. With more sh British ships in American yards at the time of Pearl, you could see them getting a quick finish, then sent out to support the Americans in the Pacific, or sent out to support the British in the Pacific. This is the thing. If you suddenly, if you have a strong, uh, if the RN doesn't have to, again, this is one of the things you have to think about. One of the reasons why the RN cannot really push the Eastern Fleet as far as they might like is because of the operation they have to do to support the Mediterranean. If you have, no, if the Italians are down to one battleship in the Mediterranean, then the forces you have to submit to the Mediterranean are far less. But also, that battleship becomes something worth taking out because then the Italians have no battleships. So, does Ark Royal get sent to hit Naples? Where Gilio Cesare is sitting there. Juno 101, any chance we get a book on Warspite? Um, maybe eventually. Eventually. Thank you, M35 members. I hope you enjoyed. Debbie again. Hello. If the Japanese never had the example term for it, would Pearl Harbor have could? Yes, because they were already planning on it. They, they're all already working on that as, as scenario. That's good. Given Drac gave us a, extra rations today, are we going to be ordered to do something with a low chance of survival and less strategic value tomorrow? No. We've got Viltrum's recording tomorrow. Thank you, George. It's always nice to get a new supporter. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole Ross. I hope you, I'm hope i glad you enjoyed it. And thank uh, thank you, everyone. Um, I hope you've had a nice time, and I hope you found it useful. Dan Freeman, also, the FAA crews did six hours. You're whining after a mere four? <laughs> no, I'm not whining after a mere four, but I do want to get in and look after my doggies and make sure they're put to bed. Because they prefer it when I'm there to, go, to put them to bed rather than when I go in and wake them up. Because if I go in and wake them up later, they then think it's party time. And that causes fun for me because it means I spend the next 30 minutes on the floor being covered by puppy licks. Which is not a bad thing, but you know. Okay. Bidron, anything special planned for the 80th anniversary of Pearl Harbor? Perhaps. Perhaps. Bavorton, thanks. I always enjoy these discussions. Glad you do. Nice experience. Doesn't prompt the Italians to try and finish their aircraft carriers. They look into it, and they would like to, but the, consistently there's so many arguments for resources, and there's a lack of infrastructure. This is the point again. The difference between Toronto and Pearl Harbor. Anything you hit at Pearl Harbor, the Americans have the industry, the efficiency to repair and rebuild. This is the big problem for the, uh, for the uh, Japanese. At uh, Toronto, if you take out and do enough damage, the Italians can't repair it. As I said, Littorio gets back in service, but Gilia, uh, but the um, other vessel, the Ca not the Conte de Cavour, the Dul let me just remember it. Dulio. It is the Dulio, isn't it? Yes, the Cayo Dulio. It takes till pretty much nineteen uh, till end of nineteen forty three to be back in repair, and that means she's no longer useful for anything. Right. That's good. If the Italians only have only have one battleship left, they may all decide to put it up in, uh, put it up in Venice as its value is now much higher. That also could be an option. In which case, the British really don't worry about it. Take care, everyone. Thank you, John Evans. Thank you, DG40. Thank you, Melee1640. Thank you, Nicole Ross. Thank you, um, Jess P. Uh, Nicole Ross, uh, when are the research assistants going to publish their thesis? Oh, good lord. Don't get me started on that. That's a mess. Take care, Donner Guy and Hammer. Take care, Knight6031. Um, thank you, Silo Manicos. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, John Evans. Thank you, John South. John Evans, the Japanese go after two nations that can outbuild them. Mm hmm. It's never sensible. Thank you, everyone. Take care and have a nice evening. Thank you for watching. I hope you've liked all the 60 seconds, uh, 60 second videos, and I hope you uh, like all the long patrols that have come out and there will probably be a comment response video at some point thank you for if you've liked the videos please like and share as you as some people know i do currently have a competition going with my aunt as to 
all the things I can get done. And no, accomplish my aunt. As to whether or not I can get to 13,000 subscribers by December the 31st. If it uh, happens, if I do, she and Mankar to take a photo of themselves wearing Blackburn Blackburn face masks, and I get family or bragging rights. Thank you, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed, as said, and um, take care. It's been a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to chat with you all, and I hope you found it interesting. Thank you, 96831, George Newman, Frank Spado, and Jonathan Burrow, Dirt Squad, and B1900 Pilots. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.